The next item of business is a debate on motion 12169 in the name of Joan McAlpin on Erasmus Plus. Uh, I call on Joan McAlpine to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee and would ask everyone who wants to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. Uh, up to 12 minutes, please, Ms McAlpine. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It's with great pleasure that I open the debate this afternoon on the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee's report on Erasmus+. Plus. The committee took evidence on this inquiry from a number of individuals and stakeholders to whom we are very grateful. I'm delighted that many of them have been able to make it along today and I would like to welcome them all to the Parliament. This piece of work all started with a visit to the Jack Kane Centre in Craig Miller as part of our business planning day last August. On our visit, we met with young people and volunteers who told us what the Erasmus Plus programme means to them and I would like to welcome Scott, Kim, Cameron, Shannon, Dale and Emma from the Jack Clean Centre to join us in the chamber today. I'd also like to thank our clerks who did such a great job of putting the report together and supervising the inquiry for us. Many of us here are already familiar with aspects of the Erasmus Plus programme. It's perhaps most well known for the role it plays in facilitating university student exchange programmes in Europe and beyond. Some of the committee's members have themselves participated in the programme and I'll ensure they want to share their experience as part of this debate. I think the committee will agree with me that we were all very surprised and inspired to learn about the full breadth of activities that the programme supports. What our report highlights is just how broad this programme is and the extent to which it supports invaluable work across so many sectors in Scotland. For example, we heard evidence from YouthLink Scotland about how important the programme is to the voluntary and youth work sectors, and I'm delighted that YouthLink Scotland is represented here today to watch this debate. The voluntary and youth work sectors play an important role in supporting our young people in wider communities. For example, I have visited Loch Arthur, a sheltered community in Beeswing near Dumfries, which is run by the Camp Hill Scotland in my, constituency membership, in my constituency region. Membership of the EU, which supports programmes such as the European Voluntary Service and Erasmus+, Plus, has enabled young people from European countries to live and work on a voluntary basis beside people with learning disabilities for whom Camp Hill is their home. Young Europeans make up 68% of Camp Hill's volunteers. These young volunteers are qualified in social work, occupational therapy or special needs education. EU programmes such as Erasmus Plus therefore provide young people with valuable life experience while also enabling invaluable support and services to be provided. Without programmes such as Erasmus Plus, many voluntary organisations which are often reliant on the goodwill of volunteers and small teams of dedicated staff may struggle in the long term to sustain the services that they provide. We also took evidence from the Chair of the University Council for Modern Languages in Scotland. She told us that Erasmus Plus plays a vital role in supporting the one plus two languages policy in Scotland and that is also a vital support, uh, source of support and funding for the professional development of our foreign language teachers. Some of the most striking evidence we heard was from the college sector. We were told how West Lothian College has used Erasmus Plus to develop award-winning programme, which was genuinely life-changing uh, for the students who participated in it. We heard how this programme enables students who have never previously travelled abroad to study cookery in France, construction in Spain, hairdressing in Portugal. One observation in particular will stick with me from the evidence that we heard. And this was that Erasmus Plus inspires students to look beyond Friday and into their future lives. Another clear message from stakeholders was that Erasmus Plus is more than simply a source of funding for these amazing projects. It also provides an important framework that enables organisations such as Youth Link, Link Scotland and West Lothian College to build networks with partner organisations overseas. This international cooperation not only helps the students who participate in the exchanges, it also offers new opportunities to the staff who support them. 
and it helps at an organisational level to share best practice and put Scottish institutions on an international stage. These illustrations hopefully highlight to you why the committee very quickly reacted and reached the strong conclusion that this programme is too valuable to lose. This is why the committee has set out a number of clear recommendations for the Scottish and UK government. To summarise our conclusions very briefly, the committee is calling for three main points of action. The UK should continue participating in the programme until the end of the current multi-annual financial framework in 2020. The UK should seek to continue participating in the next refresh of the programme, which will start in 2021, and it should seek to retain full entitlements as a programme country. And I will say a little bit more about that distinction later on. If the UK government is not able to secure continuing programme participation, we are calling on the Scottish Government to consider how it might be possible for Scotland to continue full participation in the programme after 2020. In making this recommendation, we highlight the existing institutional structures that could support this, such as Scotland's devolved competency over education and the existing support available from the British Council Scotland. The UK Government has stated its commitment to full participation in the Erasmus Plus programme up until withdrawal. In a letter, it has told the committee that the UK and EU have agreed in principle that the UK will continue to benefit from all EU programmes until the end of the current budget period. This outcome has also been welcomed by the Scottish Government in its response to the committee. And I'm sure I speak for the committee in welcoming this particular outcome in the negotiations so far. The UK notes, however, that no decisions have been made about the post-2020 programme participation since the scope of this programme has not yet been agreed. The Scottish Government notes in it response, its response that it's deeply concerned that the details of successor arrangements have yet to be proposed by the UK Government. What is important to highlight in this debate is the difference between partner membership of Erasmus Plus and programme membership. As an EU member state, the EU is able to participate in the full breadth of activities as a programme country. The committee is concerned that after Brexit, the UK may be relegated to particip participating in the programme as a partner country. This would mean we could not participate in the sport elements of Erasmus Plus, and some stakeholders, such as West Lothian College, told us that their international partners may not be able to continue working with them in the same way if the UK doesn't maintain its full programme status beyond 2020. Although the negotiations remain ongoing, we need to look beyond withdrawal and not lose sight of planning uh, uh, that is already underway to shape the future of Erasmus Plus after 2020. It's vital that Scotland's voice is not lost at this crucial point so that we can help shape the future of the programme and remain fully committed as a programme participant well into the future. We know that the British Council is engaging in those discussions at the moment and I understand it is represented in the public gallery today and I thank them for their involvement in our inquiry. I hope we'll be able to debate this afternoon how the Scottish Government can seek to influence the UK's negotiating position for the next programme period particularly the UK's ability to continue participating in Erasmus Plus with the full rights and entitlements of a programme country. I welcome the debate this afternoon and I look forward to hear all members' contributions. Thank you. I now call on Shirley Ann Somerville for around eight minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I'd like to thank Joan McAlpine and the committee for tabling this motion for debate today and welcome the Jack Kane Centre to Parliament too. And can I commend the Committee for Tourism, Europe and External Relations for their work in investigating the value of Erasmus Plus in Scotland and the potential impact should Scotland lose access to the programme following the UK's withdrawal from the EU. The Scottish Government has a long association with Erasmus. It does matter hugely to us. Indeed, it was our own Madame Ecosse, Winnie Ewing, when she was an MEP, who worked with others to set up the original scheme some 30 years ago now. Since then, it has grown from strength to strength. The committee's report rightly highlights the success of Scottish organisations in securing funding for Erasmus Plus projects. 
Scotland has traditionally performed very well in Erasmus, securing around 12% of UK funding in the first years of the current programme. And over 60 million euros were secured for projects in Scotland between 2014 and 2017. That fund is, is extremely valuable. It is the most significant international exchange and mobility programme available in Scotland by some field. And it's much more than that, however. It's about the education and youth organisations and the impact that it has on the individuals involved. The greatest value of Erasmus Plus is the experience that it provides for people across Scotland. As Joan McAlpine has mentioned, expanding their horizons, developing their skills and giving them the ambition and the confidence they need to thrive in a globalised world. The ability to spend time overseas and working with others in different countries can transform a person's life. And our whole community benefits from hosting those who come to Scotland and share with us their own culture and perspective of the world. The evidence taken by the committee in their recent inquiry bears this out and matches what I've heard in my own conversations with staff and students in schools, in colleges, universities and in community groups across the country. Because while Erasmus did begin as a programme focused on the ability, mobility in higher education, its expansion over the past 30 years has brought considerable benefits to other sectors. Within schools, for example, Erasmus Plus funding makes a significant contribution to the implementation of the 1 plus 2 language learning policy. It provides existing language teachers with opportunities to maintain and refresh their language capability through visits to other countries. It supports teachers through their qualification by funding the compulsory year abroad, which is required for the registration of language teachers in Scotland. Both of these enhance the language learning experiences of our young people at school and are essential to the success of our language policy. They're vital in equipping our young people with the skills and competencies they need in an increasingly globalised world. Erasmus Plus benefits also the young people beyond the education system as well. And I warmly welcome the decision to include youth programmes within Erasmus Plus from 2014. It's often those people who are furthest away from higher education who benefit the most from the opportunity to study or work overseas. Exchanges like these bring an international perspective to the heart of our most deprived communities. And it gives everyone the opportunity to learn about other cultures, languages and world views. This enriches the learning experience for people of all ages and opens them up to the possibilities of their own potential. For young people experiencing socioeconomic deprivation in particular, international mobility is often a distant option. And the evidence given to the committee included very powerful examples of how participation in European projects can increase young people's commitment against discrimination, their interest in political life, their respect for and appreciation of cultural diversity and the readiness to work and live abroad. This aspect of broadening participation in mobility and exchange opportunities is one that we wholeheartedly support. And I'm encouraged by the Commission's proposal to double the budget for Erasmus Plus in the next multi-annual financial framework from 2021 to 2027. And by the Commissioner's comments in November last year that said that the EU needs to keep working to open up the programme, extending opportunities for schools and stepping up our efforts to attract the most vulnerable members of our society, people with disadvantaged backgrounds and special needs. It seems that Erasmus Plus is likely to continue to develop in ways that will bring even greater benefits to Scotland in the future. But those benefits are put at risk by the prospect of the UK's withdrawal from the European Union. Since the EU referendum, the Scottish Government has worked closely with stakeholders across Scotland to understand the potential effect of the UK's withdrawal from the EU. Brexit has created terrible uncertainty for organisations that rely on programmes such as Erasmus Plus to sustain international partnerships. This has been compounded by concern at the lack of clarity from the UK government over its, over its intentions for the future relationship with the EU. This government's view is that the best way to retain the benefits of Erasmus Plus, as well as access a host of other initiatives, policies and funding programmes, is to remain a member of the European Union. Short of that taking place, the UK needs to secure the closest relationship with the EU, including membership of the Single Market and Customs Union. In terms of Erasmus+, Plus, we welcome the Prime Minister's comment in her speech in Florence on the 22nd of September 2017, 
that the UK Government hopes to continue to take part in those specific policies and programmes which are greatly to the UK and the EU's joint advantage, such as those that promote science, education and culture. However, we remain concerned that there has been no further detail or public comment to secure access to Erasmus+. Plus. The Scottish Government continues to encourage the UK Government to provide clarity to those organisations whose planning for future activity depends on knowing what the UK's future relationship with Erasmus Plus will be. While the statement in the joint report on phase one of the negotiations that the UK will continue to participate in EU programmes to the end of the current multi-annual financial framework in 2020 is welcome, the UK Government needs to confirm its intentions to continue to access Erasmus Plus as a matter of urgency. <laughs> Presiding Officer, uh, Brian Whittle. Today in Prime Minister's Could question you start again, please, Mr Whittle, your mic wasn't on. Sorry. Uh, I wonder if she's aware today in Prime Minister's questions when asked directly about this, this question that the Prime Minister stated her intention for the UK to stay within Erasmus Plus for the, for, for, for the foregoing future, ongoing future. Shirlene Somerville. I didn't hear Prime Minister's questions. I was out on a, a ministerial visit um, celebrating the Scottish Government's uh, support for elite athletes, which I, I hope Brian Whittle would uh, commend in, on another day. Uh, but what I would say to that is, well, that Erasmus Plus um, desire from the Prime Minister is indeed welcome. Uh, what we have seen from um, other discussions which are going on is you cannot separate Erasmus Plus from freedom of movement. You cannot separate Erasmus Plus and other aspects such as this and Horizon 2020 from freedom of movement. So if the Prime Minister gave um, a, a, a discussion or an answer about freedom of movement at the same time, then that would be perhaps more valuable to the stakeholders that the Scottish Government is discussing. So, Presiding Officer, in conclusion, we're an outward-looking nation. We're an inclusive nation and has benefited greatly from the access to the wide range of EU programmes. The lives of thousands of students, teachers, school children, volunteers and many others across Scotland have been transformed by Erasmus Plus over the past 30 years and we want that to continue. Programmes such as Erasmus Plus have been enormously beneficial for the lives of thousands of people in Scotland, helping to develop their skills, study and volunteer abroad and make close personal relationships with people from other countries and cultures. And I warmly welcome the committee's report and acknowledge its recommendations. And we will continue to work with our partners across Scotland towards securing our future commitment to Erasmus+. Plus. Thank you. I now call on Rachel Hamilton. Around seven minutes, please, Ms Hamilton. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, those who gave evidence to the committee and welcome those involved in Erasmus uh, to the gallery today. When students think of Erasmus, they think of the invaluable exchange programme that allows them to experience new culture, country, city and language. Not the 16th century philosopher Desiderius Erasmus, whose name encompasses the benefits of travelling and sharing ideas that the scheme promotes. At this point, I'd also like to take an opportunity to thank the clerks for their work on this report and put on record that my colleague Jackson Carlo and I supported the conclusions of the committee report. The Scottish Conservatives also agree that we want to see Erasmus Plus continued after Brexit. As things stand presently, the UK will continue to benefit from all educational programmes until the end of 2020. In a letter to the convener from the Department for Exiting the European Union, Steve Baker MP stated that the UK Government, I quote, see future cooperation in education programmes as an area of mutual benefit to both the UK and the EU, provided that we can agree a fair ongoing contribution. Involvement in Erasmus Plus has been a notable success. This translates into better job prospects for those who are fortunate enough to go on uh, onto one of these Erasmus programmes. The European Commission's impact study found that Erasmus students have better employability skills than 70% of all students, and the unemployment rate is 23% lower for those who participate. This may be because 64% of employers consider international experience a positive and 92% look for transferable skills in recruitment. The programme therefore goes beyond that fruitful and memorable year and will positively impact on the rest of the student's life. As Mike Russell noted in his letter to the committee, 
that in 2017, Scotland received its highest ever allocation of Erasmus Plus funding. Nearly 21 million was awarded compared to 16 million in the previous year, benefiting 159 organisations in higher and ad adult education, schools, youth and vocational education and training sectors. Included, some of those beneficiaries were from my own constituency. St Boswell's Primary School received £2,000 to support the professional development of the school's modern languages coordinator in Spanish. Newcastleton Primary School, Broomlands Primary School and Now Park Primary School received funding for French language immersion courses for staff members. And that's what we heard from Youth Link during our evidence session, is that the training part of it is really important and that's what enhances uh, a lot of the, the programme's benefits. This funding will play a crucial role in the development of students and teachers and, and as I said, YouthLink found that young people with fewer opportunities participating in Erasmus Plus report a significantly higher effect compared with well-off young people. And what's great is that it's open to everyone and students are supported for their travel and subsistence costs depending on need. The committee recognised this funding in its report and indeed we all on the committee recognise the excellent work being done by Scottish institutions and organisations to use Erasmus Plus funding to raise attainment. Another benefit of Erasmus that YouthLink found was that participation in European projects increased young people's commitment against discrimination, increased interest in political life, increased respect for and appreciation of cultural diversity. It also increases readiness to work and to live abroad. And this is another positive benefit that comes from participation in the programme and another reason why I'm pleased that the UK government is open to continuing that participation. Clearly Erasmus, as we've heard today, plays an important role in the whole of the UK. And I welcome the Prime Minister and the UK government's continued commitment to retain full participation until we've left the UK and also focus on the UK government's uh, um, to secure participation in this area after we've left the UK. I'll give way to Alistair Allen. Minister. I think the member meant le left the EU there, but um, uh, much as I, I um, uh, welcome what she says uh, about the, 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 the benefits of Erasmus and also the, the comments of the Prime Minister with regard to that, uh, will, will the member also agree, however, it, as, uh, as things stand at present, it is quite difficult to see how Erasmus could function fully without the benefits that come from the freedom of movement of people? Rachel Hamilton. Thank Alice, um, Alan for that um, intervention. Um, I mean, we, there are countries who are non-European members and um, they actually pay into the scheme. And there's also, you know, we've got Macedonia, Iceland, Norway, Liechtenstein, Turkey. I mean, there are ways that we can use um, negotiations um, to perhaps pay into um, the Erasmus scheme. I mean, obviously Switzerland had a bit of a blip um, and they set up a European mobility, um, I think it was called that, European mobility programme. Um, so, and that was because of the issues that they had with free movement of people. So, I mean, where there's a will, there's a way. And I think it is possible, particularly with the good work that the British Council are doing. Um, but I just want to um, talk a little bit about the, also the benefits that College, uh, College of Scotland report. 1,600 Scots go abroad to European countries with Erasmus Plus every year. And the number of students taking opportunities for outward mo mobility has doubled over the last seven years. I don't think there's any doubt that we all agree that it is a fantastic um, programme. Um, I, I've, I've taken the intervention, so I won't read my paragraph about why, how I think it could be possible. But... Um, if a way you do have time if it's not too long a paragraph. I, I, Deputy Presiding Officer, I would be repeating myself and that would be slightly boring to listeners. But, um, and if a way cannot be found, I'm sure that we can find a way, as I've said. And we, um, we all share the will um, for uh, Erasmus to be continued. And the Scottish Conservatives are open to exploring whether Scotland could participate in the programme by itself even. Um, a sentiment shared by University Scotland, Colleges Scotland and of course agreed by the committee. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, Erasmus Plus benefits students and teachers and creates opportunities that are enjoyed for a lifetime. And it helps close the attainment gap, we know that, increases employability prospects, and that's, that's all good, and helps fight discrimination, increases political engagement. And for these reasons, and many more, we here on these Scottish Conservative benches are committed to Erasmus Plus and Scotland's future participation in this programme. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, there's a hint there, there is time in hand. So it's a generous uh, seven minutes, Mr. Gray. I'm sure you can use them. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And um, 
Uh, uh, for reasons which will become clear later on, I want to start by uh, drawing attention to my entry in the Register of Interests as Chair of the Hibernian Community Foundation. Um, I think uh, this debate is an interesting one because uh, in some ways I think it rather illustrates that uh, uh, old uh, canard, sometimes uh, you don't know what you've got until you lose it. Uh, and so I, I want to congratulate the committee, I think, for undertaking uh, this particular report at a very uh, important time. If I'm honest, although I've been aware of Erasmus for a long time, uh, I, I've always had a, a, a sense, and I don't know where it came from, that Scotland was not particularly good, actually, at using the opportunities which Erasmus present. Uh, and I think uh, if it's done one thing, uh, the committee's report and the evidence they've taken has demonstrated that I was completely uh, wrong at that. And in fact, Scotland uh, has certainly in recent years become very good at seizing the opportunities which the programme provides. Uh, in 2015, for example, University of Scotland tell us some 2,000 students at higher education institutions uh, took up Erasmus uh, study, uh, funded study abroad, and that was a 35% increase on the year before. In 2017, all the programmes added together in Scotland added up to 21 million euros, and that was up from only 16 uh, a year before. If we look at uh, Erasmus-funded joint master's degrees, uh, the UK is in the top three in Europe, and 85% of those programmes are led by Scottish universities. Indeed, University of Scotland and their briefing for today tell us that 9.7% of Scottish students study abroad as opposed to just under 7% uh, in England. So the truth is, uh, we are beginning to seize the opportunities of Erasmus. Uh, and it's very unfortunate, I think, that we do that just at the point uh, as we might lose them. And, uh, you know, I say as gently as possible to Rachel Hamilton, she may hope that we can continue with the the benefits of uh, Erasmus, and we're all agreed, better job prospects, uh, support for education and training, opportunity for those from disadvantaged backgrounds. But there is no doubt that those opportunities are jeopardized uh, by the uncertainty of the whole Brexit process. The other thing uh, I learned, I think, from the, the work of the committee was something that uh, Ms. McAlpine referred to, and that is the breadth of the Erasmus uh, program, it's certainly not just about uh, languages and language study. Indeed, m my own nephew, uh, who studied uh, Napier as a civil engineer, spent a year studying in the Netherlands in a multinational course where he was able to learn about aspects of uh, uh, engineering, such as irrigation work, which is much more difficult to get practical experience of uh, here, and he benefited significantly. But it is importantly about languages too, and that's important for us now, especially when just recently we heard that uh, the number of students uh, succeeding at national four and five level in modern languages in our schools has halved in the past 10 years. Uh, and not just uh, language students though that are supported by Erasmus, uh, but indeed in my own constituency, I know teachers from law and Dunbar primary schools have been able to take opportunities uh, to improve their language skills as part of the one plus two program the minister uh, referred to. It's also not just about uh, academic uh, study. And this is uh, where I come to uh, the Hibs Community Foundation. As part of our community football program, one of the things that we do uh, is look after uh, Hibs girls and ladies. And that, that's uh, a first team which we have built into arguably the best, certainly amongst the top two uh, women's football teams uh, in Scotland. If anybody doubts that, they're playing down the road, uh, 7.45 Easter Road tonight, playing Hamilton. Anyone who's at a loose end, uh, you, won't be, uh, you won't be sorry or disappointed. But behind that, we, we've gone to great lengths to build uh, a, a very strong now uh, Girls Academy, which is about providing sporting opportunities uh, for uh, girls and young women from the age of around five, uh, allowing them to participate in sport and teamwork, uh, to learn about uh, health and fitness and sports science, and to build their confidence, leadership skills, uh, and perhaps become coaches uh, themselves. 
Uh, and one of the latest ventures that we've just undertaken is exactly an Erasmus-funded programme in which 25 to 30 uh, of those involved in Hibs uh, Girls and Ladies uh, will travel to Spain, to the Oliva Nova complex just outside Valencia uh, for a very intensive programme. Uh, learning from some of those other European countries uh, where women's participation in football is significantly more advanced and the facilities uh, and uh, the, the science around the sport is much more advanced than it is uh, here in Scotland. But also, I think it's worth noting, uh, and University of Scotland made this point in the briefing they produced for us today, that Erasmus is not just about outwards travel studied by Scottish students overseas. It also brings a lot of uh, overseas students into Scotland, which enhances uh, our university community uh, and makes it an ever more vibrant and global community. And that is an important element uh, of the programme too. And, and I said that there is a small element of tragedy in discovering how important all this is and seizing these opportunities, uh, just as there is the danger that we might lose them. And uh, uh, something the minister said, it uh, tells us that it's even worse than that, really, because the new opportunities open, opening up as the next tranche of Erasmus uh, is developed may be even greater. The proposal is indeed to double the budget for the programme and to increase the focus on inclusivity and accessibility uh, uh, for young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, young people with disabilities and so on. Exactly the, uh, the, 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 the sectors uh, of young people here in Scotland that I think we all agree could benefit most from participating in the programme. So it really is important that we do uh, raise our voice as the committee has helped us to do and to make the point that we need to not just commit to Erasmus till 2020, uh, but to find a way to commit beyond that, and indeed, as far as possible, to do that through full programme status, so that some aspects, like the sporting aspects that I've talked about, are still available to young Scots in the future, as they have been so powerfully, uh, and we see reflected in the report in the past. Thank you, Mr Gray. I call on Ross Greer. Mr Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to the European Committee clerks and all those who submitted evidence to our inquiry, in particular to the young people at the Jack Kane Centre for hosting us in the course of our work on Erasmus. The idea of Erasmus tends to be associated with middle-class university students doing a year abroad. There are clear benefits to that, both for the yeah, both for the individual young person, for Scotland and, and for Europe as a whole. But this often prevailing view of the programme isn't really that accurate as the Minister highlighted in her opening remarks. I'm not suggesting that university students doing a year abroad is not important, but what Erasmus does goes far, far beyond that. It funds programmes for young people from all sorts of backgrounds. In addition to working with universities, there are programmes with schools, with colleges, training providers, sports teams, as Ian Gray mentioned, and youth organisations. What this means in practice is that groups if students from places like West Lothian College are doing courses in Sweden, France, Germany and Italy, completing SQA qualifications that link in with European qualifications on topics covering hospitality, travel and tourism, business, engineering, healthcare, sport and education. For many of the young people involved, particularly those from working class backgrounds, experiences like this can be life changing and too often wouldn't be an option without Erasmus. West Lothian College were very clear in their evidence to the committee that Erasmus programmes have a positive impact on attainment. But more importantly, those who participated have loved it. It's grown their confidence. It's created connections with other young people across our continent and quite genuinely broadened the horizons of thousands of young people across our country. The committee had particularly valuable evidence from YouthLink, who helped youth work organisations get involved in Erasmus Plus projects. Many of their members are small organisations who typically have little administrative capacity of their own. Organisations like the Jack Kane Community Centre, who work with and for young people in Craig Miller. The focus of Erasmus funding in Scotland has been on inclusion, something many of the organisations who gave evidence to the committee were very keen to stress to us. Research noted in the committee report mentioned by their members has suggested that young people from more deprived backgrounds get more out of projects like Erasmus Plus and that it has an extremely positive impact on their attainment. It also has a clear benefit in language education, as has been mentioned, something that we are woefully underdeveloped at across the UK compared to every other country in Europe. 
When students undertake a language degree at university, that often entails a year abroad, as do an increasing number of courses that are not directly related to language education. Erasmus Plus facilitates this for many universities. When language teachers in Scotland are looking to develop their skills and improve their teaching, Erasmus provides opportunities to do that. Staff exchanges allow for cross-sector collaboration and exchange. It ensures language teachers in Scotland can enhance their skills by working directly with native speakers. When school pupils are learning languages, student exchanges give them an opportunity to truly experience the benefits of their other language, to go abroad and become immersed, not just in the language, but in the culture that it comes from, which we know is the most effective way to learn. Erasmus Plus also speaks to the kind of country that we want to be. Cultural exchanges and training and learning opportunities abroad help to increase young people's appreciation of cultural diversity, opposition to division and bigotry. There's no shortage of evidence that those who experience other cultures and communities are less likely to harbour prejudiced views and more likely to challenge those views. In this parliament, we often pride ourselves on Scotland's progressive outlook, our aspirations to be an internationalist country. But these virtues need to be nurtured and supported. It's precisely programmes like Erasmus that do that. Yet despite all these benefits Erasmus brings to Scotland, it is under threat. The UK government have blindly committed themselves to hard Brexit and ending freedom of movement. We've already heard numerous times across numerous committee inquiries how much damage this will do to Scotland. If we don't act, Erasmus Plus may well be one of those casualties as well. While third countries can associate with the Erasmus programme, they must also play by the rules. For example, it's already been mentioned, when Switzerland decided to introduce immigration restrictions in 2014, its negotiations to participate in the programme were suspended. Now, unfortunately, all indications are that the UK government does intend to introduce immigration restrictions and end freedom of movement with the European Economic Area. With all the splits within their cabinet, their ability to agree even their own negotiating position, and the regressive views held by the hard right Brexiteers who are holding the Conservative Party to hostage at present, we just can't rely on the UK government to do the right thing, to do the rational thing here. Brexit won't just make participation in Erasmus harder, it will make it downright impossible for those who currently benefit the most from these programmes. It's charities, colleges, schools and youth groups who find that they just can't participate anymore. West Lothian College made that clear in their evidence, pointing out that 100% of their Erasmus projects were with other countries that are part of European freedom of movement rules. While Scotland's universities, particularly elite universities, generally have the resources to navigate more complex rules and financially back exchange programmes with other countries outside of the EU and outside of Erasmus, smaller charities and colleges simply can't afford this. Many local authorities who support schools to do it certainly can't. The committee report calls on the Scottish Government to do what it can to negotiate Scotland's continued participation in Erasmus Plus in the event the UK Government is unwilling to do that. And I, of course, support that conclusion. But I think that we should go further than that. As I and others have called for before in this chamber, and I'm sure that we will call for again repeatedly over the coming years, we really must devolve immigration powers to Scotland. Right now, it's unclear what institutional frameworks could allow the continued participation of Scotland in Erasmus+, Plus, particularly if the UK does continue down this immensely self-destructive path of ending freedom of movement. But by devolving migration powers to Scotland, we can ensure a different path, one that allows us to continue participating in the Erasmus programme, along with all the other benefits that migration brings to Scotland. We voted to remain in the EU. We want to continue to benefit from the programmes and principles that underpin it. To in our year of young people be facing the effective end of one of our most successful youth projects isn't just tragic, it's a deliberate act of generational vandalism from a government that is wildly out of touch and it is entirely avoidable. Thank you. I call Tavish Scott, then I move to the open debate. Mr Scott, please. Thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. Uh, Monday was one of those rare um, Shetland days at this time of year. Uh, a very bright day, sparkling sea, the sun shone uh, on the uh, waves. And I stood in the kirkyard in Oliberry, a crofting community in the very far north of Shetland, at one of the most difficult funerals I've ever been to in my adult life, and watched a family bury a, a daughter, a mum, uh, a sister, uh, and someone who was just a huge part of that community. And it made me think of this debate, because one of the things Lizzie did in her, in her professional life uh, was work in the Shetland part of Erasmus, in the Shetland part of the global uh, classroom. So I want today just to reflect uh, and, re and absolutely uh, respect those who, who make and have made the Erasmus project uh, work, certainly in my part of uh, the world, and people like Lizzie uh, are the reason that so many young Shetlanders were able to travel around the world and meet people um, from, uh, uh, from uh, well, their peers, but people from different parts of, of this globe. 
Uh, and I also want to just reflect that it seems a long time ago now, but when I worked in the House of Commons to Jim Wallace, I spent um, four days, or it felt like four days, it probably wasn't four days, outside a, a then a Soviet um, embassy trying to sort out the visas so that a Shetland school, the Anderson High School, could uh, travel to uh, Eastern Europe uh, to meet their, um, to meet their uh, peers uh, from a community called Zlin in the then Czechoslovakia. Uh, that was then our take at the global classroom and how it's moved, uh, how it's moved forward. Uh, so for all the people um, around Scotland, but in this context in, in uh, Shetland, who've worked so hard to make sure youngsters uh, can meet and see and, and find out about the world around them, uh, I just want to say uh, thank you. And in that sense, Erasmus has been enormously important. I, as Ian Gray rightly said, I can't imagine... Uh, why we'd ever want to get rid of such a programme that is so effective in uh, building those kind uh, of links. Of course, it's quite important to remember EU membership is not actually a, a prerequisite of, of participation in this because uh, schools in Norway, Iceland and Turkey also are part of Erasmus. That's, but that's what makes it all the uh, stronger, particularly if you are part of islands that are in the Northern North Sea. Uh, my community's done very well. I think we've invested strongly in it. We've built it and we've worked with it. Mention was made earlier on rightly of the British Council. I want to thank them and many others for allowing that to happen. But two or three just very brief uh, examples. In November 2017, uh, Shetland got a batch of funding to allow four Shetland schools uh, to improve languages, the very point Ross Greer was very rightly uh, making. 60,000 euros, if I remember rightly, uh, in a multilingual world uh, to help our global position. And, it, and the point they made then, the, the initiators of that particular program, was that it, it would help our world, uh, sorry, help our position uh, and help uh, teachers and pupils in our position post-Brexit, uh, which was both a positive way to look at it and, for me, intensely sad as a, as a European. Erasmus Plus funding has made it possible for Shetland to also host uh, global classroom events. Uh, we had one particularly uh, splendid one back in 2015 where again uh, schools and representatives from all over uh, Europe came to uh, the islands. There was an uh, exciting moment at Aberdeen Airport where uh, again we had to uh, make some fast phone calls to get some Turkish young people through uh, immigration but I'd like to thank all those officials at that time who, who listened to my pleas to allow them through, and uh, they got to Shetland later uh, that day. And Bray High School in particular, again up in the north of Shetland, Bray High, Bray High is next to uh, Sullen Voice in the Delting area of Shetland. It's, it's uh, very much the, the oil industry school, I suppose I could loosely describe it. Welcome pupils from Turkey, Norway, Latvia, and Sardinia as part of that cultural exchange between communities on the edge of Europe. I recall a European commissioner many years ago when I was doing a ministerial job telling me that um, you were on the periphery of Europe and then he looked at me again and there was a map of a map of Europe on his wall in the, in the Berlin Wall and actually for once the Shetland was even in the right place in the map but uh, uh, the um the map in the Berlin Wall, and he said, turned to me and said, Mr. Scott, you're not on the periphery of Europe, you're on the periphery of the periphery. Uh, and that's what Erasmus has meant to us. It's meant bringing schools and bringing young people uh, from the periphery of the periphery. And we then sent our youngsters to those schools, and they spent a week in, in different parts of uh, Europe, Turkey, Norway, uh, Latvia, a Sardinian trip went as well, and Norway, where we regularly visit, uh, all to learn about cultures, learn about the economy, learn about how young people uh, do things and do things differently, and of course, all the parallels uh, as well. And the more recent um, initiatives involving the Middale Junior High School, one of our islands to the north of uh, the, the mainland of Shetland, uh, who've been working closely through Erasmus Plus on a project called Treasure with a school from Spain involving the sharing of traditions and indeed uh, of cultures. Um, we've hosted 25 Erasmus ambassadors in, uh, in, uh, over the years uh, and uh, ours have in, in that sense traveled to different parts of Europe uh, as well. So uh, I want to very much endorse the recommendations that the convener of the committee uh, spoke to some uh, minutes ago. I also want to very much endorse Ross Greer's points about the wider impact of Erasmus and why it's important. I also saw, as Brian Whittle mentioned earlier on, the Prime Minister, I was just lucky enough to have the telly on, I guess, but to, to, to watch the Prime Minister giving that answer uh, earlier on. If I was our ministerial team here, I'd just drive right into that one. Um, she gave the kind of answer that would allow some, uh, some uh, wiggle room, as we say in politics. So uh, I would seek to take advantage of that. I'm not going to make another Brexit speech. We had that yesterday, and I couldn't cope with another Jackson Carlo wind-up. So uh, let me, um, uh, let, let me uh, make just one observation to uh, conclude these very brief remarks. Uh, most young people I know, including my own kids uh, are European. They just kind of want to stay that way. Thank you very much.
Open debate, Stuart Macmillan, followed by Oliver Mundell. Mr Macmillan, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, I want to agree uh, with the comments uh, made by the committee convener earlier regarding everyone who's provided uh, evidence to the committee and not everyone who's assisted. Also, at the outset, I want to support and actually hold support this debate in the contents of the, our committee's report. And I urge the Chamber to support the report and also its conclusions and the recommendations that the Erasmus Plus scheme isn't a European status symbol uh, to be dismantled with Brexit. It's a life-changing opportunity that broadens horizons, opens minds and creates employment opportunities. Now, what isn't to like about that? Uh, as members will know that the committee heard uh, a lot of evidence uh, in relation to the Erasmus Plus programme. We heard from uh, educators, learners, managers and professionals in the sector, from schools, youth groups, organisations and business. Uh, but certainly, I think the, the Jack Kane Centre and everyone who was involved that day, uh, and the folk who are in the gallery, I think the, the way they actually uh, provided uh, their evidence and their assistance certainly was a, a novel way to educate politicians. Uh, I have a personal connection uh, to the programme in that, that uh, like others, no doubt across in the chamber, I uh, benefited from an Erasmus programme. I remember formerly my time of studying in France, Germany and also in Sweden. It was a, a life-changing experience for me and uh, which I'll come back to shortly, but just, uh, just gently some comments to, to Ross Greer. Uh, Ross Greer spoke about the, the, the middle class background. I grew up in Port Glasgow. It's not exactly a middle class background. I would encourage you to go and visit other parts of the West of Scotland region uh, and get out of Eastern Bartonshire uh, so you can learn about other, uh, other aspects uh, of the region. When Erasmus Plus was first launched in 1987, uh, there were just 3,244 students in that first year and by 2014. Over 3 million Europeans have studied through Erasmus and now Erasmus Plus, and it hopes to add a further 2 million changed lives to that statistic by 2020. In Scotland alone, there were 6,190 participants in 2016, up from the 4,975 the year before. Erasmus had a budget of over 14.7 billion euro last year, with 21 million received for Scottish programmes, up from 16 million the year before, with 159 organisations in Scotland involved in Erasmus+. Plus. The programme not only allows for student mobility across Europe and beyond, but also supports staff and projects to promote excellence in teaching and research, building upon the best practice from elsewhere, and also helps to foster democracy itself across the European Union, promoting discussions between learners and also leaders. The programme also encourages sports development and the John Money projects that promote the study of the European Union across the world. Now, we heard in the committee, we heard from Youth Link Scotland that Erasmus contributes to achieve many of the frameworks we actually have here in Scotland, such as the Curriculum for Excellence. We also heard that 70% of UK companies believe that intercultural skills to be very important. Now, we also heard from the British Council Scotland about the benefits of Erasmus as a soft power to grow the reputation of Scotland's excellent and well-regarded education system, but affects not just our education sector. Now, Jackie Colleen of the British Council of Scotland stated at paragraph 64 of the report, the fact people have had a positive experience uh, when they come here creates an ongoing positive association with Scotland throughout their careers, and stressed that it helps build an interest elsewhere to do business in Scotland. Now, I welcome the UK government's commitment to continue full involvement in Erasmus Plus until the UK leaves the EU, including underwriting uh, the successful bids. However, that, despite the commitment from the Prime, Prime Minister today, uh, Prime Minister's questions, there is still no commitment post the time when we actually leave the European Union. But does this mean that on the stroke of midnight, on the 31st of December 2020, Erasmus in Scotland will end? Uh, this would be a disaster and a victory for small-minded, narrow nationalists who can't accept that the EU actually does some good. Uh, the the DXU uh, do not include Erasmus in their higher education sectoral report, nor is their analysis of the value of the programme uh, that brings to these aisles in areas like youth work or the voluntary sector. Now, we heard from stakeholders uh, that the uncertainty is already causing problems, and Daniel Evans from the West Lothian College said uh, they are in the middle of a two-year uh, programme that ends in 2019. Normally, uh, they wouldn't need to apply again, but they're having to do so now to guarantee access for 2019-20. Now, that means a lot of extra work uh, that wasn't planned for, and it is, in his quote, a strain on us. This is the very last thing that our educational establishments need right now. Programme access is a right 
uh, for all EU members, and EEA, mem EEA members can uh, negotiate membership. But this requires bilateral agreement with the EU. Now, outside of those terms, Scotland might be limited uh, to being a partner country like Switzerland currently is. Now, we heard in the committee about the so-called Swiss model that Rachel Hamilton touched upon earlier. Now, that status it meant that their learners and educators were not able to fully participate and they lost out. We also heard they don't want to remain in the situation for too long and they want to come back to full programme member status. Members will be aware that Switzerland are in this position because of the restriction on the EU freedom of movement and the UK government's continued lack of clarity over freedom of movement may well then affect our possible future Erasmus relationship. In paragraph 78, we quote Marion Spuring, uh, who is the chair of the University Council for Modern Languages in Scotland, and I know that her colleague, uh, Dr. Joe Carson, uh, is in the public gallery. Marion Spuring uh, said, if we don't have freedom of movement, it would be a disaster for academic and social reasons, for the internationalisation of the country, and for uh, the experiences of our students, staff, and our research. President Officer, I absolutely agree. Earlier in the report, in paragraph 33, we quoted Marion Spuring again also, when she was explaining how important the studying of languages actually are. Free movement is key for Erasmus. Mobility of learners and educators is indeed of the fundamental underpinnings of the scheme. Now, my Erasmus journey started in 1993 when I started university, as well as having the time of my life and many life experiences I will cherish forever. A few other things happened uh, in preparation for this debate. I counted up actually all the nationalities of people that I'd met. Uh, I met 20 when I was going through my degree and when I was doing my masters, there were 11 of us in the class of which there was 10 different national backgrounds, including Guadeloupe, South Korea and Argentina. Nobody can tell me that the Erasmus Plus scheme or its predecessor programmes don't matter. They do matter. They change lives, they open opportunities for many peoples, and like me, and who came from locations where employment opportunities were not a plenty. Now, I care about educating future generations, and I care about the learning of languages, and that's another reason why Erasmus Plus matters. I'm presenting officer, I urge the UK government to open their eyes to this wonderful programme, grasp the opportunity to remain on Erasmus Plus, and help future generations become even better citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McMillan. I think people are wondering what your wonderful experiences were, but we're going to hear about that some other time, perhaps, Mr Carlo. <laughs> I call Oliver, Oliver Mundell to be followed by Graham Day. Mr Mundell, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, as members comment, I don't have any uh, wonderful experiences, uh, at, least, at, least, at least from the Erasmus uh, Plus uh, scheme. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, I'm very pleased uh, to be speaking in this important debate. And although not a member of the committee, I do want to put on record my thanks to committee members and all those who contributed to the report, including young people in the gallery today. As members will be aware, I voted to leave the European Union, uh, but I think it's vitally important to distinguish between that decision and the suggestion that somehow Brexit means leaving Europe and, serving, and severing all existing ties with the continent. Erasmus Plus, to me, is a prime example of the kind of continued cultural and educational partnerships we should be looking to continue long into the future. Erasmus Plus has been of great benefit to many young people across Scotland and our wider society. As uh, Joe McAlpine touched on, Erasmus is still perhaps best known for its work in enabling university and college students to travel internationally and facilitating international students being posted here in Scotland. This clearly enhances the vibrancy and global nature of our campuses and helps Scottish domicile students to develop a truly global perspective. This is important, uh, particularly so for those from uh, more deprived backgrounds who might not otherwise have had these opportunities. And on that point, I would like to associate myself fully uh, with the remarks the Minister made. Um, as NUS uh, Scotland have also noted uh, that uh, Erasmus Plus has, uh, has been proven to enhance uh, participants' educational achievements and is firmly a driver of social mobility. To put this, uh, this into perspective, the programme currently helps around 1,600 Scots go abroad to European countries every year. Um, and this has been on an upward trajectory, as some other members have mentioned, uh, showing just uh, how strongly uh, young people uh, feel about the project. And it is a great opportunity uh, for outward mobility, um, with, particularly with these numbers doubling in the past 
uh, seven years. However, that's only part of the wider programme, as we've heard. And in my own constituency, for example, Brown Hall Primary School received funding to support staff development in language learning. And Lockerbie Academy have also taken part in a learning exchange with a school in Italy. Dumfries and Galloway Council's award-winning youth service uh, have also received financial support to host an international training course to upskill youth workers on active citizenship. These are just a few examples, and I know that members across the chamber will have hundreds more. Recently, as part of the cross-party group on Brexit, uh, we held a meeting facilitated by YouthLink Scotland. And during those discussions, I was struck by how important and valuable the young people present uh, from across Scotland believed Erasmus Plus uh, to be. Um, as the briefing from University of Scotland confirms, the benefits of Erasmus are not just anecdotal. They recognise a notable correlation between periods of mobility and enhanced academic achievement by students, as well as a boost uh, to skills and future employability. That's why I'm particularly pleased that the UK government has publicly stated that the UK is committed to continuing full participation in the Erasmus programme up until we leave the European Union and that people across the UK will continue to benefit from all Erasmus programmes, including Erasmus Plus, until the end of the current budget, pro, uh, current budget period. I'm even more pleased uh, that the Prime Minister today has signalled her continued support uh, that that position will continue post-2020. Yep. Minister. Well, to um, take that intervention, just on that, as I didn't um, see PMQs um, earlier, but the Prime Minister seems to have said that Erasmus is one of those we have cited that we may wish to remain part of, but of course we're in a period of negotiation with the European Union, and we'll be dealing with these matters in that negotiation. Is he happy enough with, with that level of assurance? Oliver Mundell. I, I, I am happy with that level of assurance because I think it shows, it shows the commitment. And I think what members in this chamber need to do is be pragmatic. And I think, people, I think people in Scotland would be very disappointed if at a point when we're trying to establish the fundamental economic relationship between the UK uh, and the EU after Brexit, if we were putting th that part of the negotiations on hold. This is something that we'll come to uh, in time. And I think at this stage, it's important that there's a firm commitment. And actually, rather than trying to score political points and ramp up uh, some idea that there's a disagreement around uh, how important Erasmus is, people should be working together uh, to make the positive case uh, so that Scottish students and those from across the UK can continue uh, to benefit from Erasmus Plus, uh, which is one of the EU's most successful and iconic uh, programmes. And Just a wee minute, Mr. Mundell. Mr. Carlo and Minister, that's very, very rude of your wee conversation when Mr. Mundell is making a very interesting speech. You agree? Thank you both. I, and I think you just I, go on, Mr. Mundell. I, I'm not sure I agree, presiding officer, that it's a particularly interesting uh, speech, <laughs> but I am, I am trying. Um, on uh, the point I was just making, I think it uh, is worth noting that a number of states uh, that have already been mentioned, including uh, Iceland, Norway, Liechtenstein and Turkey, do continue to participate fully in Erasmus+. Plus, and I think that does provide uh, hope and reassurance that reaching an accommodation is both possible and likely. Uh, just a minute, Minister. Sorry. I thank the member for giving way. And while I appreciate that Turkey is in a different category, uh, the, the member is aware, obviously, that the first three of the, uh, or the three of the, the countries he's just mentioned there are part of the economic, uh, European economic area uh, and part of the freedom of movement of people, which brings us back to the point before about the importance of that. Uh, briefly, Mr Mundell. I, I, I would say uh, the Minister has effectively made my point for me by pointing out uh, that Turkey doesn't fall into that category. And secondly, I think we have to recognise there are a huge number uh, of academic uh, and other uh, global partnerships and relationships that exist uh, outside of the EU's freedom of movement uh, principle. And I think uh, it will be very sad for me if I find out down the line that the EU have somehow blocked Scotland or blocked the United Kingdom from continuing to engage in something as important as this uh, because of a lack of flexibility uh, to, to accept the democratic will of the people of the United Kingdom. Yeah. And I think, uh, in conclusion, presiding officer, uh, it's really about trying to avoid 
uh, division avoid a sense uh, that, uh, that there's a problem here and it's about encouraging organisations to continue to apply, individuals to continue to apply uh, and put bids in while the UK is still a member state because those will be honoured and I think that that's the priority now and to wait uh, for the right moment in the negotiations to ensure that this uh, very important policy continues post-Brexit. Thank you very much, Mr Mundell. I call Graham Day to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Mr Day, please. But, President Officer, um, with the opportunities that Erasmus Plus affords people, it would be a great shame if Scotland were no longer to be able to participate in it or be denied an opportunity to participate as fully as it currently does. So I want to thank the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee for the report and the effort they put into highlighting this important issue. Given the planned expansion of Erasmus Plus from 2021 to 2027, with its budget being doubled to €30 billion, Euros, this is the time to be at the heart of the scheme, not detached or even semi-detached from it. One of the aims of the scheme is to broaden the opportunities that may not otherwise be available to young people and those who support them, such as teachers. That's undoubtedly a good thing, culturally, socially and indeed economically. And being able to experience the real lives of people in other countries opens minds, provides connections and enhances experiences in a way that going on holiday or sitting in a classroom never will. So there's a clear need for Erasmus Plus and firm evidence of its value to Scotland and Scots. As a former sports journalist and still keen football fan, I want to focus part of my contribution on some of the impacts that the Erasmus Plus scheme has had on football in this country. Erasmus Plus uh, funding allows for young players to spend time at winter camps via the vocational education and training strand. With the East of Scotland European Consortium project area alone, since 2014, Aberdeen, Cowdenbeath, Dundee United and St Johnston have all participated in this. And as a Dons fan, still buoyed by their finally winning at Parkhead to finish Premiership runners-up, let me focus on my own club and how they have benefited from Erasmus+. Plus. Aberdeen's under-20 squad travelled to Austria in 2015. The under-18 squad travelled to Portugal in January 2016. Host partners provided access to innovations in physiology, uh, dietics, uh, coaching delivery, tactical analysis and cardiovascular training. Those young players who travelled were undertaking a modern apprenticeship in sporting excellence. Stephen Gunn, Aberdeen Football Club's operations manager, said, and I quote, the opportunities provided by these visits were hugely important in the development of our young footballers, both personally and professionally. And then there's St Johnston. 20 apprentices were able to gain experience of the training methods at an acknowledged UEFA Centre of Excellence in Portugal. The host partner was a regional training and coaching complex used by Portuguese and European professional teams, uh, which is recognised as having world-class records in talent identification, innovative coaching, and player development. Apprentices had the chance to learn about innovations in uh, physiology, uh, dietics, coaching delivery, tactical analysis, and again, cardiovascular training. The club believed that this would lead to improved success rates for these apprentices in being admitted to the professional ranks of UK clubs, and that improved academic attainment and European exposure would improve employability in secondary careers. And, presiding officer, life outside of football is a vital consideration because only a small percentage of these apprentices will go on to make a full-time career, a full-time living from the game. St Johnston in their application highlighted that young people in Scotland are, and I quote, in the main rather parochial in nature and exhibit a reluctance to undertake occupational mobility. This is particularly so with young people in the region where many have poor records of academic achievement and are socially disadvantaged. The club therefore uh, committed to using their participation in Erasmus to encourage other young people to seek out mobility opportunities, something to be welcomed, I would say. Moving on from learning football skills to teaching languages, six schools in my constituency uh, have received Erasmus Plus funding since 2014, uh, Arbroath Academy and five primary schools. The two plus one language strategy requires teachers to have the confidence to teach languages and the Erasmus Plus programme has allowed teachers from these schools to undertake intensive courses. The schools are clearly seeking to properly engage their pupils in language learning, for example, by equipping teachers so that they can provide students with cultural awareness and knowledge to help them to understand the importance and the relevance of learning a modern, uh, modern language in today's global economy. And of course, the skills that the teachers learn can be shared with colleagues 
And it's not just language learning that schools are boosting, uh, boosting through Erasmus+. Plus. Many schools are improved, uh, involved in exchange or cooperation programmes through projects on, for example, climate change. And in relation to climate change, that matters because, as we know, climate change doesn't respect borders, nor does any one country have all the answers or own best practice. So what does the future hold for Scotland's involvement with Erasmus+. Plus? The committee notes that uncertainty about the UK's participation in the programme beyond 2020 is creating an additional strain on some stakeholders on the current programme period. And unlike Oliver Mundell, I'm far from encouraged by Theresa May's comments earlier today, which didn't go nearly far enough. Even if the UK does find a way to continue participating in the scheme, there may be restrictions placed on its involvement. The example of Switzerland is highlighted in the report owing to its immigration policy that's been in place since 2014. That means it cannot be a full participant, particularly in relation to sport. And as Ian Gray and I have already highlighted, that matters to Scotland. Opportunities such as these are under threat from Brexit and the UK government must ensure that any negative impact is minimised. But I'd also back the call from the committee that if the UK government is not willing or able to secure the UK's continued participation in Erasmus Plus as a programme country, then the Scottish Government should explore whether it would be possible to use existing institutional structures to allow Scotland to continue its participation. Presiding officer, once again, let me thank the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee for highlighting this important issue that has implications for my constituency and, as we've heard this afternoon, indeed the whole of Scotland. Presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr MacDonald, please. Thank you very much. Uh, as a member of the committee last year, I was among those who had the opportunity to visit the Jack Cain Centre in Craig Miller in August. And the young people we met there, as Joan McCartwin said, told us how Erasmus Plus had provided them with the opportunity to travel, uh, to meet people of the same age in other countries, and that uh, several of those young people had had no previous such opportunity to travel much beyond their local community. Equally, for the 35 students and staff at the University of Aberdeen who wrote to me in March, the benefits they identified were very similar with a focus on formal education rather than social engagement. They talked about removing barriers and the opportunity to study and live in different countries. For both groups of young people, maintaining that access for those who came after them was crucial. It would be unfair, the students said, for those who reap the rewards from participating in Erasmus to not deny that opportunity to future generations. And that is the challenge we now face. For a generation and more, we have benefited from free movement of students, teachers, and groups of young people between Britain and ever wider areas of continental Europe. As things stand, there is no guarantee uh, that future generations will be able to enjoy such freedom beyond 2020. The question of how to protect those benefits is therefore of great importance, and the committee's report is a very useful contribution to finding the right answer. Now, yesterday's Brexit debate was an argument about reserved and devolved responsibilities. Today's debate is about whether we should seek to agree post-Brexit to pool some of our resources with the European Union in order to maintain cross-border initiatives to mutual advantage. And if we agree that should be done, the question then is how? And I think it's important to recognise the scale and the significance of those cross-border links. From the University of Aberdeen and Robert Gordon University alone, over 600 students and nearly 100 staff have gone abroad under the Erasmus Plus programme in the academic years 2014-15 and 2015-16. And many students and teachers have also come to Aberdeen and to Scotland from other countries. Good for them and good for us. As a single example of what Erasmus Plus actually means, I would mention uh, a young woman I met last weekend at a fundraising dinner in Aberdeen hosted by the region's enterprising community of Syrian former refugees. This postgraduate student is a citizen of an EU Baltic country who has used Erasmus Plus to study in France and in Spain and is now doing a master's degree in Scotland, while also hoping to work with Syrians in Aberdeen to learn and to share her language skills. With French and Spanish to an academic standard, fluent in English and having grown up speaking both Russian and Estonian, here was a model European and global citizen of the next generation. We surely want young Scots to match that breadth and depth, 
but a failure to join the successor scheme to Erasmus Plus would put that at risk. And in addition, this, that story makes the point that Erasmus Plus benefits Scots who go abroad, but it also benefits Scotland from those people who come from other countries to work and study here. Of course, promoting an outward-looking culture among our young people is not just about access to European programmes of educational and cultural exchange. Figures just published show that the number of young Scots achieving qualifications in modern languages, that very area uh, I've just described, has fallen by almost half in the last 10 years. And that is clearly very serious indeed. It's an urgent issue for Scottish ministers and indeed for this parliament to address. But very few young people in Scotland or anywhere else voted in favour of Brexit as Mr Mandel did because they wanted it to reduce their ability to travel or to work or study abroad. And so loss of access to European exchange would certainly count as an unintended consequence of the vote two years ago. Of course. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much. I thank uh, Lewis MacDonald for taking uh, the intervention. Uh, I'm sure Lewis MacDonald would agree with me that uh, in terms of encouraging people to go and take that time to go and study abroad, this isn't just something that's been a, an issue maybe over the course of the last uh, decade. It's actually something that's been there for quite some time because I think as someone mentioned earlier on, some people at times, unfortunately, can be quite insular regarding their own communities. Bruce MacDonald. Ab absolutely. It's a generational issue, as Stuart McMillan has said and knows from his own experience. The generation typically represented by members of this parliament is a generation which has had the benefit of that over the last 40-something years. Uh, the issue now is how we secure those kind of benefits for the next generation, and I think that is uh, the critical uh, uh, point. We know that UK ministers have guaranteed that commitments made under Erasmus Plus will be honoured for the full period of the current programme to the end of 2020, and that is, of course, welcome. But what they must now do is look beyond that and beyond 2020 to make commitments of their own to maintain engagement in whatever successor programme the EU chooses to put in place. Now, clearly, Labour's priority would be to take forward membership uh, and involvement in such programmes. What the committee is essentially doing is calling for the Conservative ministers to do the same. And, of course, Oliver Mundell quoted uh, Theresa May's statement today, an expression of willing, of course, is an important starting point, but it remains a long way short of concluding an agreement with the European partners. And while uh, many people on the Conservative benches, and I welcome Rachel Hampton and Jackson Carlos' uh, support for this report, um, while they support the principle of seeking to be part of that successor scheme, the issue is how much they, they recognise they matter, but the issue will be how much do they matter to government ministers when weighed in the balance uh, against economic interests and indeed backward looking notions of national sovereignty. But as has been said, there are plenty of precedents uh, for participation in Erasmus Plus. It is not confined to member states of the European Union. It is possible the minister cited uh, those members of EFTA in the European Economic Area, which are programme members, uh, and Mr Mandel cited Turkey, which is none of those, which is not a member of EFTA and the EEA, but is nonetheless a programme member. So those, those countries which are out with the European Union and European Economic Area, uh, which have uh, access to these programmes, have negotiated that on a bilateral basis. They have given it sufficient priority uh, to put in the balance against other things, and that uh, fundamentally uh, is the challenge here. But clearly participation will have to be paid for in addition to the financial contributions already identified, and there will have to be a new agreement on freedom of movement for those involved. So those are uh, big asks, but they are uh, worth uh, uh, seeking answers to because of the significance of this programme for future generations of young people and to maintain that access going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Jamie Halco johnson Mr Doris, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as others have done, can I uh, thank the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee uh, for the, the report that we're, we're debating here this afternoon. Uh, Presiding Officer, Erasmus Plus provides hugely important opportunities for young people in my constituency to gain many opportunities to broaden their horizons, to gain new skills, both social and educationally, and building their confidence in personal development. I'm particularly delighted that the Minister welcomed the 2014 changes to open up Erasmus to, to youth groups. There was previously a perception Erasmus was for the middle classes at university. I'm not saying that was a reality, but it was generally a perception that people had. 
Uh, that was certainly uh, made a huge difference, the opening up to, to youth groups, certainly to young people in low-income households and deprived areas that I represent, who were able to seize many of the opportunities that otherwise would have been very difficult to ever obtain. And I have several wonderful youth organisations in my constituency, but let me tell you about the benefit Erasmus Plus has been to one of them, and that's Royston Youth Action. Royston, the Garangad, is a fantastically resilient community, but not without its challenges. Levels of unemployment, low pay and low income families make it an area of particularly significant deprivation levels. There are also various health and uh, societal related challenges within the area. Yet Royston Youth Action have sent local youngsters in recent years to Austria and to Finland. They're planning further. They've also hosted youth exchange uh, trips. I think that's important. It's not just about young Scots going out to Europe. It's about Europe coming to Scotland. They've hosted a youth exchange last year uh, for young Europeans to Scotland. And this July, they're hoping to host uh, other young people from Finland, Austria and Estonia, up to the Garngad, up to Royston, to see what we have to offer. And that's vitally important. Uh, I'd like to quote from Sharon Kelly, who's the project coordinator at Royston Youth Action. Here's what she said. Many of our young people have never been abroad before, and getting to go on trips such as these funded by Erasmus Plus has quite literally been life-changing for them. Some of them do not even have passports, and we, brought them, we bought them for them and also uh, ensured that they had the correct clothing for travelling and so on. All of the trips are funded by Erasmus Plus, and so there is not a high cost involved in taking the young people away. The shortfall is provided for by local fundraising. Many young people from areas like this cannot afford to go on school trips abroad, as these trips cost £600 or, or, or so. And so being able to provide a trip abroad through a youth project is fantastic. I, I think her words were better than any way I could, could capture it, but I suppose you should also go for a young person that's benefited from those trips abroad. And I want to uh, mention Tony, who is 16, and she spoke about um, uh, other countries coming to Scotland to see what Glasgow had to offer. And she said, I'm quite a shy person and I do not have a lot of confidence, but it was nice to meet young people from Austria, from Poland, from Hungary and from Finland to get their views about life uh, in the countries uh, and what their hopes are. At the end of the week, I felt a lot more confident and able to speak to everyone from different countries and I learned so much during this week. I think that's powerful testimony and the benefit of Erasmus+. Plus. Um, so, does Brexit throw all this into doubt? Well, let's just be honest about it. Absolutely. Uh, the Conservatives' Brian Whittle mentioned earlier in the debate the UK Prime Minister's endorsement of Erasmus Plus at Prime Minister's questions today. There was, there was no endorsement. It was a dreadful equivocation. She said, we may wish to remain part of Erasmus, but we will be dealing with those matters in negotiations. That's hardly a ringing endorsement or a signal of intent. The future of young people in deprived communities I represent should not be a, pa a plan and a game of negotiations in relation to Brexit. That's simply not acceptable. The Erasmus Plus report also highlighted another concern. If the UK government sees a value of Erasmus, and we've heard some kind words in relation to that, uh, then hopefully they would be capturing or monitoring the impact or success of that. But then looking at the the, the, the committee report. I see the committee notes in this regard that the Department for Exiting the European Union sector report on higher education does not include Erasmus Plus and does not appear to have produced an analysis of the value of Erasmus Plus to those sectors participating in the scheme, such as youth work, voluntary or school or further or higher education. So I am sure when we get round to those negotiations, the UK government will look for an evidence base to continue with Erasmus Plus it's not collecting the data, and I don't think that's actually acceptable. Sure, McMillan. Thanks, uh, thank Bob Dodds for taking the intervention. Surely, uh, I'm sure Bob Dodds will agree with me that surely the time is now to actually start having these discussions, as compared to waiting until the very last day uh, before having discussions post. Now we're back on track with time, so you're in your last minute. Oh, that's not so helpful, uh, <laughs> Presiding Officer. Uh, I, I would like to think the UK government can multitask. Uh, you know, I think there's a quite easy deal to be done here. If the UK government is willing to put the money in, and if the UK government is actually willing to, to guarantee freedom of movement for all the young people from other countries and from Scotland in relation to Erasmus+, we have a deal. We can have this in double speed time. 
There is no issue in relation to that. And it's not consequential in the underpinning economic relations uh, and, and deals in relation to the wider Brexit. That is actually just a nonsense. Uh, now, I was going to mention some of the details about the cash in relation to uh, uh, Erasmus Plus. But let me just say that in 2021, the cash is doubling. I've got other youth organisations in my constituency who are positioning themselves for bids for Erasmus Plus. But before they can even prepare a bid, it looks as if the UK government may pull the rug from under their feet. That's not acceptable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's now speeches of six minutes. Jamie Harker Johnson, we followed by Daniel Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm duly warned. Um, can I start by thanking the members and the clerking team for the work that they've done around Erasmus Plus and the report we have before us today. The, cur the current Erasmus Plus programme covers a period from 2014 to 2020, backed by a substantial budget of around 15 billion euros. Each year, it funds somewhere in the region of 16,000 exchanges for UK students to work or study abroad. Studying abroad provides excellent opportunities for students based in Scotland and the rest of the UK to improve language skills, to experience work outside the country, and to broaden their horizons in different parts of the world. In the years it has operated, the Erasmus programme has built enduring links across Europe and further afield. Erasmus is also an opportunity, as the committee has recognised, to build on the UK's soft power as, uh, as an area where we already do well. The programme's Erasmus Plus sponsors strengthen our cultural standing, both within Europe and more widely. And the evidence also suggests that it's supported and popular with people who have gone through the Erasmus programme. Emerging in the 1980s, Erasmus followed a number of other exchange programmes created within Europe that operated in the early part of that decade. Since that time, Erasmus Plus has brought together a number of programmes under its umbrella. And as it stands, the programme supports a variety of different areas of education, training, sport and youth work. The study abroad schemes in universities are probably the most visible component, but there are many other examples of work. Staff in education, for example, can also benefit from the opportunity to train and to work abroad. Erasmus also features in many of Scotland's schools. As the committee observes, 2.3 million euros of the, 20, the total 21 million euros spent in Scotland in 2017 were directed to schools, with a further three quarters of a million for youth work organisations. And I mention these elements because when we consider the future of the UK's relationship with Europe, it is clear there is a great deal of positivity from across the board towards the work of programmes like Erasmus. We've seen this from a range of organisations in the education sector who have contrib contributed their views to inquiries both in this Parliament and in the UK Parliament. In her speech in Florence back in September, the Prime Minister outlined the promotion of science, education and culture as examples of advantageous programmes and policies that have benefited the UK and the other 27 member states of the EU. I expect there is broad consensus in this chamber with the view that moving forward, the UK should continue to work together with the EU member states on areas of mutual interest. The UK government has also outlined its willingness to make an ongoing contribution to cover our fair share of the costs involved in such programmes. And as the Minister Steve Baker pointed out in his letter to the committee, the content of the successor programme to Erasmus Plus beyond 2020 has not yet been clarified. We know, however, that there are a number of possible proposals that have been suggested at this stage, as well as serious uh, consideration being given to increasing the budget for Erasmus. Participation in the successor programme or programmes will necessarily form part of the negotiations on the UK's future relationship with the EU, and that remains ongoing. However, in the meantime, the importance of programmes like Erasmus was, agreed by, Erasmus Plus was agreed by all parties in the December European Council summit, with the UK representation echoing the Prime Minister's willingness to continue cooperation on education and culture. For some sense of the precedence behind this, we can look to the five non-EU countries that directly participate in the programme. As has been mentioned before, Iceland, Norway and Liechtenstein are the most obvious, but we also see amongst the programme countries, Macedonia and Turkey, which are not part of either the EU or EFTA and lack much of the integration with the EU that the EEA states previously mentioned have. These countries are then followed by a fairly lengthy list of partner countries from across the Balkans, in North Africa and the Middle East, in the Caucasus and Russia, and of course Switzerland. These pre-existing relationships are of significant value in maintaining student mobility going forward, and they spread the impact of Erasmus beyond the EU. These countries have specific and various relationships with the Erasmus programme, with the programme countries obviously having the closest interaction. And in its report, the committee has outlined its view that programme country status, status is what the UK should be seeking in the future. Of course, we will look at the emerging shape of the post-2020 successor programme, but I'm similarly minded that we should continue to participate as fully as possible. 
Presiding officer, Erasmus Plus has been a positive feature of our relationship with the EU in the past decade. There seems to be a broad agreement that it will be beneficial to continue in the future. That is not, of course, to say that Erasmus Plus is perfect. In common with many EU initiatives, it can be restrictive and bureaucratic in parts. It has limited global reach, currently, the support, uh, it's currently supported by the International Credit Mobility Scheme. But there is scope to do better in that regard and to look outward. There are areas in which the UK can be a constructive voice, working together with colleagues across the other participating countries. It is clear, there that, the, uh, it is clear that there must be considerable thought given to how we continue, co continue cooperation in education uh, is, is supported after the UK's departure from the EU. That must happen not just across this Parliament, but across Scotland and the rest of the UK as well. We can see that is happening both here and in other places. And in that reg regard, the committee's report is to be welcomed. Thank you. I call um, Daniel Johnson to be followed by Richard Lockhead, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to be taking part in this afternoon's debate because it gives us an opportunity to have a different sort of debate about Europe. I think all too often debates regarding Europe in, in recent times have been either those of constitutional clash or economic calculation. But I think Europe is much broader than that and it's much more important than that. The EU is not just about trade. The EU is not just about migration. The EU is not just about the single market. Indeed, the Euro Europe is not just the EU. Europe is about people and it is about culture. And I think that, that we must be mindful that that was the, very much the mindset for, at the founding uh, moment of the European project. It was about integration. Integration as a means of preventing war. And so yes, economic integration was a vital component of that, but it was only as a means of that integration, and that cultural integration was just as important, if not more so. Now, I know Oliver Mundell, who's not in his place, made a, a similar point, and I think it is important that we don't simply conflate withdrawal from the EU with withdrawal from Europe. And yes, I think if we can participate in European institutions and programmes, we must seek to do so. But I would caution him. It's not the, the course of action I would advise. It's not the one that I would want. And I would caution against a pick and mix approach to Europe, one which sees programs as simply bargaining chips, I think much as uh, uh, Bob Doris and, and, Steve, uh, and, and Stuart McMillan have set out. But if we are in the position we are, we must look at the benefits of the programs we participate. And I think this afternoon's debate has been a useful opportunity to explore why Erasmus Plus has been so important. Because I think if you can uh, 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 promote cultural exchange at that young age, you can foster the views and understandings that I think so many members have so well set out this afternoon. And 14 billion, pounds, uh, uh, billion euros of funding which is available, 20 million that has been received by Scotland is clearly of huge value, but its true benefit, I think, is incalculable. So I very much welcome the committee's report and this debate for many reasons. Yes, because the benefits and importance of Erasmus, I think are, it's important that we hear and we discuss those, and importantly, how we can preserve those. But more importantly, that so that we can discuss how we can take forward European participation, explore the possibilities of participating in, in Europe, both in, in terms of the specific sense in Erasmus, but also as a general principle. But it is also, I think, an opportunity that we can set out our views about how we can pursue being European in a much broader sense than simply just within the, 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 the parameters of Brexit or the European Union. Now, at this point, I would like to turn to matters closer to home and speak a little about Edinburgh University. And I'm hugely indebted to, their, to them for their help that they provided me ahead of this. And I know that they are proud to have participated in Erasmus since its inception in 1987. And since then, as the programme has grown, so has Edinburgh University's involvement. Now, again, I'm sorry that Ian Gray is not in his place, because I, I did think I heard him say that he was wrong. And indeed, he was very wrong, because not only is Scotland a, a, a significant participant in Erasmus, Edinburgh University is the UK's largest sender of students via the Erasmus scheme, and the largest host in Scotland. Over 12,000 students have participated in Erasmus just at Edinburgh University, and they currently have agreements with over 300 institutions and more than 20 nations. And the benefit is not just about Edinburgh students having a fantastic year. It helps them learn languages, grow their understanding of other cultures, and it also is about welcoming those who arrive in Edinburgh from other countries, enriching both the university 
but also our city and indeed our country. And that is why Erasmus has been so important, not just because it provides a good time for students, although I'm sure it does, but, and not just because it has diffuse cultural benefits, but it actually has concrete benefits for those students who take part themselves. Students who take part in Erasmus have lower unemployment rates, higher average incomes, and better degree outcomes. But of course, Erasmus also goes beyond students, having a wider international and cultural impact. But there's one other interesting bit of evidence I discovered, was that there have been one million Erasmus babies since 1987, which I think we could all regard as a, an outcome of enthusiastic student exchanges. But we do have to talk about Brexit, because that is why we're having to talk about Erasmus and discuss uh, benefits. And while Edinburgh University is, is uh, committed to, to its collaboration, indeed it's seen application rates rise, the benefits of Erasmus are in jeopardy. And that is the, 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 the true benefit of this debate. And yes, I think there are opportunities to explore. People have discussed the, the examples of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Turkey and Switzerland. And yes, we must urge the UK government to fully explore the possibilities. But that can't be simply a, 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 an acknowledgement that has been of benefit to commit to participation up until the end of this current round, or indeed the Prime Minister's uh, quote today from uh, Prime Minister's questions, which they may wish to remain part of Erasmus, we need a full commitment to opening that dialogue, to securing uh, the possibilities, and actually committing to uh, taking part in Erasmus in the future. But likewise, I think the Scottish Government should examine the options and possibilities it has for participation. Education is a dissolved, a devolved area, and I think government at its best is when it is innovative and proactive. And can I suggest to the government it should explore its possibilities for being innovative and proactive in, the, in regard to looking at taking forward Erasmus from a Scottish government perspective. So I wish we weren't having to have this debate today, but I think it has been a useful opportunity to explore how we can maintain our commitment to Europe, explore bilateral relations, and, and above all else, make sure that students continue and young people continue to have the opportunities of international exchange that Erasmus has afforded them in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Richard Lockhead to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Richard Lockhead. Um, I wish to associate myself with the comments of our committee convener, Joan McAlpine, in thanking uh, the clerks for all their hard work on this report, fellow members of the committee, and of course all the witnesses who gave uh, oral and written evidence. Erasmus, of course, was a famous European philosopher, Erasmus of Rotterdam, and in the late 14th and early, in late 8th, 15th and early 16th century, of course, he lived in France, Switzerland, Belgium, and England, of course, amongst other places, so he very much took uh, advantage of free movement of people uh, all these years ago and of course he also taught at the Queen's College in Cambridge where there is today the Erasmus building and the Erasmus room. So there is of course uh, an irony in that he uh, has this scheme named after him but England voted to leave the EU and this is what we're debating today is the future of Erasmus. He also coined a phrase in the land of the blind the one-eyed man is king which takes me nicely on to the EU referendum campaign because that was very largely conducted in a horrible atmosphere that didn't really touch upon how Europe benefits our everyday lives in this country or certain sections of society. And it was very much focused on uh, unhealthy topics with lots of misleading information and indeed lies uh, as well. Absolutely happily from yourself, of course. Oliver oh, Mandel. I, I thank the member for giving way. Do you think uh, the member would agree with me that referendums in general are... Uh, divisive and unpleasant uh, by their nature, and that's been the pattern of recent uh, political events uh, here in the UK. Well, I certainly think referendums are based on accurate information and reality. And of course, given many of the changes that have taken place between nations down centuries have not involved referendum, but involved much more um, unhealthy ways of taking decisions over the future of countries, I think it's fantastic to have referendums in this day and age, but I really wish that all campaigns would be responsible during those referendum campaigns, and the Leave campaign was far from responsible. Yeah. But one thing that's certain from the last referendum campaign is that young people played a role, unfortunately not enough of a role in the referendum campaign. It's estimated that 75% of people under the age of 24 voted to remain. Unfortunately, the turnout of people under the age of 24 was smaller than the turnout of people over the age of 55, and therefore the UK voted to leave the EU. And no doubt one of the reasons why so many young people were in favour 
of the EU was programmes like Erasmus and, of course, free movement of people and the ease of travel around Europe. And people, young people under the age of 24 have grown up with that throughout the whole of their lives. And, as I said before, they enthusiastically got behind the Remain campaign in 2016. In the <coughs> backdrop to the referendum campaign, unfortunately, issues like the Second World War were not discussed. And, of course, the European Union was born out of the ashes and wrecked Europe as a result of the Second World War. And since then, there's been lots of programmes looking at how we can have cross-border cooperation, a cross-border exchange uh, across the continent. And Erasmus, over the last 30 years, of course, has been a prime example of how Europe can work close together and people can have their horizons expanded by travelling to other countries to live and work or learn. And Erasmus has been exceptionally successful uh, in doing that. And indeed, Scotland is a very international, outward-looking country. Uh, I was interested to learn that 9.7% of students at Scottish institutions study abroad, compared to only 6.9% in England and 7.2% across the whole of the UK. So actually, there's evidence to show that Scotland is an outward-looking internationalist country, particularly in terms of young people wanting to live and study overseas. And that is borne out by the statistics over the success the EU success story, that is Erasmus, in terms of the 60 million euros that's been invested in that in Scotland since 2014 across 700 projects and with the increasing number of young people taking part in Erasmus over recent years. And of course, it's a two-way process. We have more international students studying at our university compared to the rest of the UK nations uh, as well. But leaving the EU has brought concerns for those people who've benefited from Erasmus or continue to be involved in terms of their employment with that programme, or who want to take part in the future. And there are many, many concerns. The committee heard from uh, Marianne Sporing, for instance, of the University, uh, the University Council for Modern Languages Scotland. She said most of our students go through Erasmus+. Plus. If we do not have freedom of movement, it would be a disaster for academic and social reasons, and for the inter interna internationalisation of the country, and for the experience of our students and staff, and for research. And Luke Humberston of the N NUS Scotland said, as we've seen from Switzerland, when rules and freedom of movement or, or immigration are changed, it makes developing bilateral agreements with individual countries much more complex. And there are many, many other concerns that were expressed to the uh, committee. Of course, in terms of concerns, there's also many benefits illustrated to the committee of Erasmus uh, as well. And the University of Scotland briefing said that there's a notable correlation between periods of mobility and enhanced students' academic achievements, skills and employability. And 93% of learners agree that they see the value of different cultures after participation. Uh, and there are many, many others. Uh, Emily Beaver of YouthLink Scotland said, the focus of the current seven-year programme has been diversity and inclusion. Research has shown that young people with fewer opportunities rate the programme more strongly than well-off young people do, so that, focus has, so that focus has been successful. So there are many benefits, uh, and therefore that's why the committee has made the recommendations that have been made, as explained by the committee convener, Joan McAlpine, uh, in her opening speech uh, as well. We do need clarity as soon as possible. Uh, I have concerns. Firstly, there's a lack of clarity. There's the fact we've only got a guarantee to continue to fund this as for as long as we're part of Europe. Well, we're leaving Europe soon. What happens thereafter? I'm also concerned about the long term. These are long term issues. We should be looking at what's happening in 10 years, 20 years and the next 30 years, just as we've experienced the success of Erasmus in the last 30 years. And my concern is what's going to happen is the UK government are going to give short term guarantees I don't know how long they'll be for. We know we've got one at the moment up until we leave Europe. There may be a further one for another few years. Who knows? Then they'll stop the funding. And the funding the UK government has saved by leaving Europe will not be passed to Scotland. So the Scottish government will be left once again picking up the pieces for these really successful programmes, which will stretch our Scottish budget even more as a consequence of decisions taken out with Scotland. And that's a real concern. So we have to find a way in which we get a guarantee from the UK government to continue to fund Erasmus, make sure the negotiations are successful so we can be a partner in that programme in Scotland and continue to ensure that the young people of Scotland still have the opportunity to work and study overseas, bringing all the benefits for their lives that have been brought over the past 30, 30 years as well. <clears throat> Thank you. Could I call Alexander Stewart to be followed by Willie Coffey. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Erasmus Plus programme has benefited millions of students across Europe and further, giving them the opportunity to study, to train, to gain work experience and volunteer abroad. Our continued participation in this programme should send a clear signal that we wish to continue to work constructively with those in Europe as we leave the political institutions of the European Union. 
It is clear from the Erasmus Plus that has been extremely successful in improving the job prospects of its participants who on average have significantly better employability skills than those who do not participate in the programme. But the success of the programme here in Scotland goes well beyond simply improving the job prospects of participants. Within my own region of Mid-Scotland and Fife, there have been many successes that have taken place in universities, in colleges, in schools within that region, and individuals have benefited from that. For example, it assists universities and colleges in establishing new contacts with other institutions across Europe. And we've heard already today that the University of Edinburgh has Erasmus agreements with over 300 institutions uh, across uh, Europe and further. Moreover, the scheme allows students to benefit from experiencing different cultures while studying for their qualifications. It unlocks their potential, it builds the networks that they need for the future, and it gives them new opportunities. For all those reasons, I am pleased to see that the report from the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs Committee, uh, and I pay tribute to members of that committee uh, and the staff and the clerks that were participating in the process, and I look forward to joining that committee uh, if the, the motion goes through this afternoon. Uh, and from uh, next week, I'll have the opportunity to participate uh, in that committee, and I look forward to that. Because, as we've said, the goals that have been set uh, to ensure that Europe uh, and the European Union parties, and we all want to see, every, every party in this chamber wants to see this continue, because we can see the benefits that are happening within our constituencies and in our communities and in our regions. The Scottish Conservatives have always wholeheartedly supported Erasmus programme, because they see that the ethos and the outstanding opportunities that have taken place. Uh, when Europe students uh, participate in Erasmus, it has often been their first international experience, the opportunity for them to enhance their education, at the same time experiencing new cultures and new organisations. They get the chance to exchange and enhance their skills, and that is a real benefit. The added bonus is that it has, has also given them the opportunity uh, to support and grants. So there's financial support that's taken place to ensure that these individuals had that opportunity. And we've heard from members in the chamber today about what has happened in their own communities when individuals have had the chance to develop that skill coming from backgrounds that didn't give them that chance normally. And this programme has opened that for them and given them that opportunity. Indeed, others have mentioned uh, that despite the fact that Erasmus Plus is financed, uh, the administration through the European Commission, there are a number of examples of countries that are not part of the EU, but who are fully participating in the scheme, who make financial contributions. Many of them engage in the programme as a partner country, uh, but with somewhat limited access, while Switzerland, as we've already heard, redesigned as a partner country following decisions to end free movement within the European Union. Places like Turkey and the former Yugoslavic Republic of Macedonia continue to be full members in the scheme, despite not having freedom of movement within the European Union. Yes. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Stewart, I'm sure, will agree with me that certainly paragraph 73 of our committee report highlights how important that free movement actually is in uh, regards to uh, Turkey and Macedonia. Alexander Stewart. I'm, I'm, I'm not just putting that in any way. I think that is very important within the process. We can therefore uh, conclude, presiding officer, that even the contributions that we have seen within the European Union and participate within this process give us the opportunities. And the report on this challenges the opportunities from higher education and from, from leaving the EU. Uh, the House of Commons Education Select Committee suggested that given that the UK's position is a more popular destination for EU students uh, than some other countries and the arrangements that include continued full membership of the EU uh, would benefit both sides. And I believe that very much to be the case, that we can, we can secure that. So in conclusion, mm. presiding officer, it's clear that the arrangements can be found to allow students from the UK and Europe to continue studying, volunteering, gaining work experience and training within uh, these other countries. And the benefits for that are immense. Uh, I, I look forward to seeing and hearing what will take place 
with a regard to the European Union and the, 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 the partnership working that we've seen and has continued to develop because they're able to reach agreements. Uh, and I look forward to seeing that the agreements can be reached and that we can work together collectively in support of this because we've heard today so many benefits that take place and it's our duty in this parliament to ensure that we sing that and we make sure that that is going out and we make sure that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet to ensure that all government uh, takes pla place, whether it's the Scottish government or the UK government, because it's vitally important for the benefits of generations to come that the UK and Europe are like. I support the programme and I want to see continued success for all to ensure that we can see this for the future. Thank you. Thank you. And before we come to our closing speeches, I'd like to call Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, President Officer. When we talk about Erasmus, we should probably start by recognising and honouring the pioneering work done by the wonderful Sophia Carada, Mama Erasmus or Mother Erasmus, who established the whole concept as far back as 1976. As a young Italian student in 1958, she came back to Italy with a master's degree from the University of Columbia in New York, only to be laughed at by her professor at the University of La Sapienza in Rome, who told her, you can't travel all around the world and then pretend to steal a degree here. So she spent another year studying in Rome to complete her master's to the satisfaction of that university. Sophia felt that others shouldn't have to go through this and started developing the idea of a European project which allows students to study abroad as part of their exams and to have that recognised internationally. In 1976, for the first time, degrees achieved by Italians in France were equally recognised in their own country. And in 1987, the Erasmus programme started to take off. Erasmus was born. She even said in a recent lecture that the programme was probably illegal at the time, since there were no agreed legal mechanisms in Europe at that time to facilitate something like this. But she did it anyway, and we're all the better off for it. Now, more than four million students have already experienced this incredible exchange programme, and Sophia's dream is to make Erasmus an internationally recognised programme across the world. It was, she said, always a universal idea, not just a European one. From those early beginnings, it took around 20 years to top the one million mark in numbers of participants. But now we're seeing one million newcomers every three years. Its scope is much broader now, embracing vocational, apprenticeship, management, and even sporting programmes too. In Scotland, there were around 6,000 taking part in 2016, with around 1,600 of those being students, and our participation rate in Scotland is much higher than it is in England and the other nations of the UK. Our Scottish universities are incredibly successful in winning funding to coordinate the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's degree projects, and these account for over 85% of those projects. So we can see how important Erasmus is to Scotland and why it's important to get an agreement in place. Uh, the committee, the clerks and staff deserve our thanks for bringing the report together at this really important time. And the messages are clear. We need some commitments pretty soon from the UK government about its intentions beyond 2020. The committee recommends that the UK government negotiates to retain programme country status, which would ensure the continuation of Erasmus in Scotland. According to the report, Turkey and Macedonia, who are not EU members, have secured this arrangement and have put in place agreements on freedom of movement for all participants, an important feature of the programme. So surely, surely the UK can at least match this. The European Parliament itself is working on its next budget for the years ahead, and the Commission would like to double the Erasmus budget to around 30 billion euros. So we need to know now if we are in or out and what our contribution will be towards this amazing programme. If the UK walks away from Erasmus beyond 2020, which would be a scandalous thing to do, the committee has asked how the Scottish Government might continue to support our citizens to participate in the programme. Now, President Officer, a real life experience is probably more valuable, uh, I think, than all the stats we can share this afternoon to illustrate the importance of Erasmus. My daughter Neve spent six months in Sweden from last summer, and here's a, a brief extract of what she had to say. It was an invaluable experience in Sweden, which I am so grateful to have been able to participate in. It built my confidence, independence, and developed my interpersonal skills, opened my mind, and was very humbling. 
Travelling and living in a different country, finding my way, making new friends, interacting with different cultures was a wonderful experience. I made friends for life and had the opportunity to make amazing once-in-a-lifetime memories, such as travelling across the Arctic Circle to Lapland, being hosted in a yurt with the Sami people who keep reindeer, drinking glog and hearing about their unique way of life and, of course, seeing the Northern Lights. Academically, she says, it was fantastic to be studying politics with students from all over Europe, escaping from the bubble and discussing our perspectives on contemporary issues. Having to act as the UK rep in a Brexit negotiation role play in a room full of Europeans was not the most enjoyable part for her, but she says we at least managed to reach a deal at the end of that process. <laughs> I felt that I was taking on an ambassadorial role in representing my university in Scotland, which I'm extremely proud to have had the chance to do. I'm eternally grateful for my experience. It has shaped me forever in the most positive way. The things I got to see and do and the people I met will stay with me for the rest of my life and would not be possible without the Erasmus Plus Exchange programme. And it would be a real tragedy for students to miss out on this chance in the future. So, presiding officer, from seeing a slightly shy, apprehensive and tearful daughter one day in August last year, making her way from Glasgow Airport to a new experience in Gothenburg or Utebura, as the Swedes call it locally, <laughs> then returning six months later, full of chat and stories, brimming with confidence and wondering what the fuss was all about in the first place, that's when the importance and relevance of Erasmus actually sinks in. Would Erasmus have happened anyway without Sophia Karadi? Quite probably, but she had the dream and the determination to make it happen. She rightly said Erasmus isn't just about higher education, it's a programme of experience and immersion in another country. Sure, it costs a lot to do this, but the value of Erasmus can't possibly be measured in terms of the cost alone. It's quite an incredible idea created by an incredible woman, and I think all the governments have a duty to make sure it continues. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to closing speeches and I would ask Mary Fee to close for the Labour Party. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This afternoon's debate has been a mostly consensual one with members from across the Chamber expressing a clear commitment to the continuation of Scotland's involvement with the Erasmus Plus programme. And in closing for Scottish Labour, I will firstly touch on the speakers in the debate and the benefits of the Erasmus programme. However, I do want to focus some of my remarks on the personal experiences of a member of my staff. John McAlpine, the convener of the committee, gave us the details of the, the, the background to the inquiry and, and the work that they un undertook. And Shirley Ann Somerville highlighted the impact that Brexit could have, as other speakers did also. And I was particularly pleased to hear Ian Gray commenting on the um, Hibs Community Foundation and the work that they have done with Erasmus to support and encourage the participation of women in, in football. And Ross Greer and Oliver Mundell both spoke of the wider benefits of the programme. And Graham Day again highlighted the benefits um, to football through the Erasmus programme. And Lewis MacDonald, I think, perfectly illustrated the benefits of Erasmus when he spoke of the young woman from Estonia and the importance of the programme to her. And I think it's also worth repeating the comments that, from Lewis MacDonald when he said that Erasmus Plus means Scots benefit from going abroad, but Scotland also benefits from other people coming here. And, presiding officer, it's extremely encouraging that in the last year, Scotland has successfully obtained its highest ever allocation of Erasmus Plus funding. However, it is deeply regrettable that Brexit casts a, a cloud of uncertainty over Scotland's future and Erasmus Plus. And it is disappointing that the UK government have only given a short-term guarantee of UK participation in Erasmus until 2020. And I firmly support the committee's recommendation to the UK government to commit itself to participation in the Erasmus Plus beyond 2020 and for the Scottish Government to clearly outline its priorities for the Erasmus programme. The Erasmus Plus programme gives our young people the independence and the responsibility to flourish as young adults th through offering opportunity to live for up to one year in another European country. And this does give our young people the opportunity to learn another language, 
the opportunity to immerse themselves in another culture and the opportunity to better understand different values and different worldviews. And my office has witnessed firsthand the tangible benefits of Erasmus. In August 2015, one of my staff, Rory Stride, embraced the opportunity of the Erasmus programme, moving to Sweden to study history and politics at Stockholm University. And although he chose to study at Stockholm, there was the opportunity to study at the University of Groningen, the University of Lisbon, or the University of Oslo. And through his experience of living in Stock Stockholm, not only did he have the opportunity to become a connoisseur of cinnamon pastries and a fan of Scandinavian drama, he also benefited hugely by immersing himself in the everyday culture, the everyday norms and the everyday values of the Swedish people, living his life in a residential area of the city like the average Stockholmer. And for the first time, he had the opportunity and the responsibility to live independently in a European capital city. He visited other Swedish cities, attended football games at Hammarby Tele 2 Arena, ice hockey matches at Jürgen Globen Arena. He visited Skansen, the oldest open air museum in the world. He visited the Nordic Museum, the Swedish Parliament, and frequented the numerous coffee shops scattered throughout the picturesque cobbled lanes of Stockholm's old town, the Gamla Stan, for fika, which once again involved a cup of coffee and the cinnamon pastries that he learned to love so much. He made a range of new friends from a variety of countries, including Germany, the Czech Republic and South Korea, he was taught by leading Swedish academics in political science and learned new approaches to studying and a new perspective on history, learning about Sweden's indigenous Sami population. Socially, Erasmus offers our young people the opportunity to broaden their horizons by learning more about the different cultures of different nations, their distinctive language, their shared values, and their national outlook. <clears throat> the Erasmus programme allows our young people the chance to appreciate and understand how interconnected and similar we are as Europeans. And academically, the Erasmus programme offers the opportunity for students to share ideas <clears throat> and to rigorous, rigorously debate a range of concepts. It allows our young people to develop an understanding of the similarities and the variances in the worldview of their European and international peers, which emerge from their differing backgrounds and their differing lived experiences. And in coming to a close, presiding officer, it's important to reiterate that on these benches, we fully appreciate and fully recognise the importance and the value of the Erasmus Plus programme and fully support Scotland's long-term involvement with the programme post-Brexit. The world is undoubtedly becoming smaller, and leaving the European Union does not mean we must detach ourselves from Europe. We should focus on prioritising the protection and the promotion of all opportunities for our young people to learn and develop from their European neighbours. And it is imperative that the Scottish Government and the UK government does all it can to ensure that this vital opportunity for cultural exchange and social development are available for future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Jackson Carlow to close for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can, can I begin just by observing that this is a report uh, with which Joan McAlpine, Tavish Scott, Ross Greer and myself have all associated. Uh, and I mean, that in itself is, that's before we've got Richard Lockhead or Stuart McMillan or Mary Goujon 
or even Rachel Hamilton, we've managed to come up with a unanimous agreement around this report. And I think it's worth repeating that because at times this afternoon I wondered whether or not that was the case. And I too would like to thank the clerks for their work, not just on this report, but on others as well. And I think this committee in which I've been pleased to serve but now leave uh, since 2016 has been at its best uh, when actually we have had singular focus and have arrived at a unanimous conclusion. And I know there's a very valuable uh, work being currently done on the future of the screen sector in Scotland, which I very much look forward to seeing in its conclusion. Uh, can I come back to the comments of Ian Gray? Because I thought many people will associate themselves with what he said in not properly understanding the success of the Erasmus scheme to Scotland over very many years. And I thought that was a worthwhile point to make. And also to Ross Greer, at least in the first half of his comments, because in the first half he actually explained the breadth of the initiatives that have been incorporated within the Erasmus scheme, which again I don't think are fully appreciated. It was often said that it was simply a program for middle-class uh, young people, and I think Ross Greer detailed all the different ways in which it was appreciated. But then, of course, he had to spoil it all by going into one of his polemics. And I would just say to Mr Greer, all this would count for a lot more if his party hadn't abdicated their democratic responsibility to actually contest the election which was about Europe last June. Only three of his side did one being his leader who came forth in the seat that he actually fought. And I would just say, if you're going to comment on these issues, it's not just a case of saying here you want the, uh, the transfer of migration to this parliament, a policy which Professor Sir John Curtis has shown 63% of Scots do not want. You have to test these points out with the electorate as well. However, this Erasmus is not a policy which is owned by any one political party. Uh, and it's often said that this is all about the secret agenda of born-again Brexiteers. Well, I represent Eastwood. It's the Conservative-held seat in the United Kingdom with the highest Remain vote of any. And many of the young people, if not all of the young people there, are internationalists, as young people across Scotland, I think, instinctively now are. Yes, it has got many middle-class children, that would be undeniable, but it's got young people from challenging backgrounds as well. I met and understood and appreciated during the, the European referendum and since their commitment to an internationalist perspective. And I think Tavish Scott was right, although I think he used the analogy more broadly. They just want Erasmus and that ability to work and to be educated and to participate in schemes across the European Union and the wider world in an uninterrupted fashion. So let me make it perfectly clear, it's not acceptable to me if the outcome of our exit from the European Union is one in which we are no longer able to participate in the Erasmus programme. I think it's perfectly clear that the direction of the UK government is that we will, and nobody has really referred to it, but the UK government has formally responded to this report, and it has gone beyond 2020. It's made clear that all and any bids which have been submitted, while the UK is still a member, even if they've not been improved until after we've left, have been, will be honoured. And they've made it perfectly clear that UK participation in the future of the Erasmus programme is a key aspect of the, the UK's negotiating position. Yes, of course. Ross Greer. Thank you very much. I'm grateful for Mr Carr taking the intervention. He heard the same evidence that I did. What impact does he believe the loss of freedom of movement will have on Erasmus participation for the likes of West Lothian College? Jackson Carlo. To understand that there are countries, and Turkey is one of the ones that's been evidenced, where bilateral arrangements have been arrived at, which have allowed them to stay members of the Erasmus programme. It's required freedom of movement of the participants. And I think it's also important to recognise it's not just important to young people from Britain who want to participate either here or internationally in Erasmus. The United Kingdom is one of the favoured destinations, one of the most favoured destinations of young people in the rest of Europe who wish to participate in the Erasmus scheme. So to answer Lewis MacDonald's point, it's not a case of balancing that against the economic advantage. There's a huge cultural and social advantage, but there's a key economic advantage to our participation in the Erasmus programme as well. Uh, can I say that I enjoyed the speeches? Yes, of course. Lewis MacDonald. I, I appreciate the point he makes, absolutely. Would he, is it his opinion? Uh, his view that that uh, economic benefit is properly understood and how will it be weighed in the balance by his colleagues at Westminster? 
Jackson. One of the purposes of this report and the unity of purpose that there has been behind it in this Parliament is that it gives us an opportunity as Scottish politicians to argue that very point and to assure it's properly represented in the debate that now takes place leading through to that negotiation. Now I enjoyed the contribution of Tavish Scott who reminded us that Erasmus is very often successful because of the commitment of individuals and I think his contribution there was much appreciated. I was sorry Dave, uh, Oliver Mundell told us he'd no wonderful experiences in his life, a terrible and of his father, the worst I've ever heard. Uh, I would say to Daniel Johnson, look, can I make an offer? Can I take you out to lunch just to jolly up your life a bit? You're so darkly unhappy all the time, Mr. Johnson. Life doesn't need to be like that. Um, and then can I kind of conclude with the observation I was reminded of during this debate, and I have to paraphrase Churchill here, but I think he said something about the, the art of a successful politician was to argue with absolute conviction and certainty what the future would be and then afterwards to explain with absolute conviction and clarity why it then hadn't happened. Uh, and I think that I hope both sides of this argument have fallen on either side of that at times. Um, this report united Parliament. Scottish Conservatives have associated itself with all its conclusions and all its recommendations. It would be a shame if others now sought to divide the Parliament from that outcome. All of us together this Parliament, all of Scotland's politicians, I'm sorry, I'm now at my final Mr. seconds, Mark, but we'll discuss it over lunch. All of politicians <laughs> need to work together now to ensure that the objective we all want to secure, which is our continued participation in Erasmus, is one of the outcomes of these negotiations that we're about to enter into. I'm confident it can be, but let's have a glass half full, not a glass half empty. Thank you. Thank you. And can I call the Minister Alistair Allen to wind up for the government? Thanks, Presiding Officer. I'm not sure how much time you're planning for me to speak. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, that's good. Um, I'd like to commend the work of the Culture, Tourism and External Relations Committee uh, in giving organisations from different sectors in Scotland the opportunity to give their views to Parliament on the value of the Erasmus Plan. And indeed, I, I do think that there has been uh, some consensus uh, in the Chamber today, certainly consensus around the report uh, and consensus around the value of Erasmus Plus. The questions arising this afternoon have not been so much about should it be continued about, uh, rather than about how it might be continued in the future. So I acknowledge uh, the recommendations and the conclusions in the report. Um, as the Minister for UK Negotiations and Scotland's Place in Europe said in his letter to the committee yesterday, uh, we will consider these as we continue our work with the sector to mitigate the very worst effects of Brexit. Now, like Tavish Scott, I want to resist being wound up over Brexit, Brexit this afternoon, um, but the evidence given to the committee and the testimony that the government has received since the EU referendum has painted a very clear picture of what participation in Erasmus Plus brings to Scotland. The funding is important and valuable, but it is the effect that the programme has on thousands of people's lives that is most significant. Now, Ian Gray and Bob Doris uh, both pointed to uh, the fact that Scotland has been getting better, much better, at availing itself of the opportunities presented by Erasmus+, Plus, and particularly uh, the benefit for young people from less privileged backgrounds. And the analysis um, of the impact of what the loss of access uh, to Erasmus+, Plus might mean, uh, is a relevant question for us, I think, today. And another relevant question is, of course, um, what happens beyond the next year or two. So ever since the EU referendum, the Scottish Government has, as I said, tried to engage with stakeholders across Scotland to understand how the UK's withdrawal from the EU might affect them. Now, the feedback that we have received um, has played a significant role in shaping the Scottish Government's position uh, as set out in Scotland's place in Europe. And this includes feedback specifically on the value of Erasmus Plus from universities, colleges, schools, youth organisations and others, and other funding programmes, and their concerns about how losing access to Erasmus Plus might affect them. Now, the Scottish <laughs> Government uh, has heard many first-hand accounts from students, volunteers, administrators and others uh, about their experiences and thoughts on this. And we've heard how organisations are finding their planning at the moment is hampered by the continuing uncertainty of which a number of speakers today spoke about. For example, time spent abroad uh, is a critical part of some university courses such as modern languages. Prospective students who are currently considering where and uh, what to study from the start of next academic year will not know whether or how this part of their course will be supported. 
The main message is uh, concern about the lack of clarity for the future. Recent confirmation in the joint report on phase one of the negotiations uh, that the UK will continue to participate in EU programmes to the end of 2020 is welcome and I am happy to welcome it. But stakeholders urgently need to know about the future beyond the next year or two. We continue to press the UK government to provide some clarity about their intentions with regard to Erasmus+. Plus. Now, welcome as the, the Prime Minister's recent comments are around future Erasmus commitments, possibly. Um, we need answers now about how the UK can uh, make uh, uh, aspirations around that a reality, uh, providing us with some, some detail beyond um, the statement made today. Indeed. Rachel Hamilton. Minister, for taking intervention, um, would the Minister detail how um, you're engaging with the UK Government currently to um, make the representations of, of the um, value of Erasmus? This is, a, this is a point which uh, uh, Ministers uh, have uh, engaged officials uh, at uh, both governments uh, to, to discuss on a regular basis because we have both publicly and in official contact made very clear about the value of Erasmus. And also we've, we've sought to establish where um, Erasmus fits into the, the negotiating priorities and timetable for the UK government uh, in its, its present situation in the Brexit talks. But Scotland's preference, uh, as I say, and I think the, the preference of most people in the chamber, uh, is to retain access to Erasmus Plus as a full partner. The question really is, uh, and it was raised a number of times in the debate today, about what kind of access that is. Now, of course, um, uh, EEA countries uh, have a, a particular ease of access to Erasmus, given uh, the freedom of movement of, uh, freedom, freedom of mov movement of people. Um, but a number of people in the course of the debate um, have uh, pointed to other examples, such as Turkey and Macedonia, and countries which have, have uh, reached their own arrangements with the scheme. That's certainly all true, and it's certainly relevant, but the point is that time is running out, and that if we are seeking or even talking about um, arriving at such an arrangement outside uh, the European economic area, then we need to be arriving at an idea of how that might work sometime very soon indeed. More positively, it should be said, um, and others pointed to this, that the budget for the current Erasmus Plus programme is 40% higher than its predecessor. The fact that the Commission recently proposed doubling the budget for the next iteration of the programme indicates how highly valued the programme is across Europe. We anticipate that the Commission will publish more uh, detailed proposals on the format and content of Erasmus Plus from 2021 onwards in the coming months, and we will analyse those proposals closely and work with stakeholders across Scotland to identify what our response should be. However, uh, the, uh, whatever the Commission proposes, and despite the lack of uh, immediate detail uh, around the, the UK's relationship with Erasmus Plus after 2020, we do intend to engage fully in discussions with partners across Europe on the, the future of the programme. Presenting officer, uh, to conclude, Erasmus Plus represents an unparalleled opportunity for students, staff, young people and volunteers across Scotland. Uh, there is no other programme that compares with Erasmus Plus in providing so many opportunities to so many people uh, and no prospect of a viable alternative being developed. The prospect of losing access to Erasmus Plus should uh, worry us all and uh, especially as it looks to expand further and to become more accessible to those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, it is uh, one example, Erasmus Plus is one example of the extraordinary benefits of the European Union. This is what we are seeking to preserve in making the case for continued membership. And if that is not possible, I join the committee in urging the UK government to commit to securing the UK's position uh, as a full programme participant in Erasmus Plus from 2021 onwards. Thank you very much. And can I call on Claire Baker as Deputy Convener of the uh, Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee to conclude the debate. Um, thank you, President Officer. It's a pleasure to close this debate and it is my first time doing so as Deputy Convener. I would like to thank all members from around the Chamber for taking part in this afternoon's debate, which has been an interesting discussion highlighting the key issues identified by the Committee report. The consensus in the Chamber in recognising the value of Erasmus+, with many members highlighting work in their constituencies, 
An agreement over the desire to remain within the scheme should send a strong message to the UK Government that we believe in its value should be recognised within the ongoing negotiations and that any effort must be made to ensure we still benefit from the opportunities it clearly provides. I would like to thank all those who provided evidence for the committee report, as well as thanking Scotland's colleges and NUS for the briefing they provided for today's debate. Presiding officer, the committee were encouraged to see the increase of funding Scotland has received from Erasmus+. In 2017, we received the highest ever allocation of Erasmus Plus funding. Nearly 21 million was awarded compared to 16 million in the previous year. This was explained to the committee as a consequence of it being the 30th year of the Erasmus programme with an increased profile and bigger budget, but also a continuing and growing appetite for international exchange. The funds benefited 159 Scottish organisations in the higher and adult education, schools, youth and vocational education and training sectors. As Graham Day said, this is surely the time to be engaging with the scheme, not leaving it. The main focus of the current seven-year Erasmus Plus programme is diversity and inclusion. NUS Scotland describe it as a driver for social mobility. And as members have recognised, the programme has been successful and, um, and a big benefit to many young people from disadvantaged backgrounds, with Bob Doris speaking about Royston Youth Action. Young people with fewer opportunities are amongst those who rate the programme most highly. And many stakeholders gave us examples of how the programme had changed the lives of many young people, such as the Jack Kane Centre in Edinburgh and West Lothian College, who gave powerful evidence to the committee. This afternoon has been excellent in members highlighting the range of work that Erasmus Plus supports in their own constituencies. The committee does welcome the Prime Minister's agreement in principle of participating in the programme until 2020, which does provide a welcome degree of assurance for current participants. But members have emphasised their concerns about the future, which I will return to. The programme, while being most recognised for its involvement in universities, also supports colleges, youth work, schools and teachers, as well as a sports programme. The committee heard from YouthLink Scotland about just how valuable Erasmus Plus is to the work, their work in Scotland. YouthLink explained to the committee that their funding goes a long way to support the sector, as Ross Greer identified, many youth work organisations are led by small teams of staff with limited resources. And according to YouthLink Scotland, any loss of investment due to leaving the EU would present extreme challenges across their sector, which is already struggling to sustain the minimum level of services and project management. Rachel Hamilton and Tavish Scott talked about the work of schools and their constituencies. Marianne Sporling, in evidence to the committee, explained how vital it is for the international outlook of Scotland's young people and how it supports the implementation of the 1 plus 2 language policy in our schools. The committee also heard how important Erasmus is for teacher training and development, from initial training to CPD. As Ian Gray said, only last week we learned the number of Scottish pupils passing forage language exams has halved over the past 10 years although encouragingly the numbers achieving higher and advanced hires have increased. But we do need to look at expanding our opportunities for learning languages. Being able to work, communicate and trade with other countries is increasingly important to our economy. As Stuart McMillan identified, Jackie Killen also spoke about the broader value of the scheme, the softer power of the UK cultural relations, the importance of mutuality of exchange, all fostering interest in doing business with the UK, visiting as a tourist or studying in the UK. And Daniel Johnson made important points about the future of the programme, but he must have known that the Brexit babies would be the headline from the debate. Can we just keep the conversation down, please? We can hear the member speak. President officer, many members got to the nub of the issue, which is what we face for the future. And Lewis MacDonald talked about how to protect and secure the benefits. A key concern for the committee is what will happen after 2020. The UK Government notes in its response to our report that no decisions have been made about post-2020 programme participation since the scope of this programme has not yet been agreed. It is unfortunate that the UK is unlikely to have, well, sorry, it is unfortunate the UK is likely to have a reduced influence over the direction in its response to the committee. The Scottish Government has said that it is deeply concerned that the details of successor arrangements have yet to be proposed by the UK Government. The committee makes the case for the UK to maintain its status as a programme country after 2020. 
This type of participation is currently open to all EU member states, acceding countries and EFTA countries party to the EEA agreement. Under current expectations of the direction of the UK Government is heading, this would make programme country status difficult to achieve, but if there is to be the possibility of a deal, that must be pursued. It would be unfortunate if the UK is not able to secure programme country status, as it would then not be able to take part in the full breadth of the programme, particularly those areas relating to sport, a benefit highlighted by Graham Day and Ian Gray. The committee considered the model that has been developed by Switzerland, which has a lesser status as a partner country after they introduced immigration restrictions. Stakeholders advised us that this is not desirable and should not be seen as a reasonable compromise because it means you cannot access the full breadth of the programme and it involves negotiating a complex bilateral agreement with the EU. That is why we are arguing for the UK's involvement in Erasmus Plus after 2020 to be prioritised in negotiations with the EU and for the UK Government to negotiate the UK's continued participation as a programme country. But this does raise complex questions. Where will it be prioritised within negotiations? How will it be compatible with UK immigration policy? What will the cost be if we are to continue? The committee have also considered what happens if this is not the outcome. So the committee are also asking the Scottish Government to undertake sectoral analysis of the impact of the withdrawal from the EU in terms of Erasmus+. Plus and to consider ways that Scotland could continue membership. So, Presiding Officer, it has now been agreed in principle that the UK will continue participating in the programme until 2020, but the question remains what happens beyond 2020. And Erasmus Plus is not the only concern of the further and higher education sector. The impact of Brexit is potentially damaging to the sector, and there's a great deal of uncertainty around the future of the funding and exchange programmes with Colleges Scotland saying there is anecdotal evidence suggesting that invitations to collaborate in European projects are already reducing. So this afternoon the committee is calling for the issue to be prioritised in the negotiations because we all recognise, given the strong evidence we have heard, that Erasmus Plus is too valuable for us to lose. Thank you. That concludes our debate on Erasmus. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 12258 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a business programme. Could I ask anyone who objects to say so now? And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move the motion. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No one objects. So the question is that motion 12258 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. The next item is consideration of two Bureau motions. Motion 12259 on committee membership and motion 12260 on committee, substitu committee substitution. Uh, could I ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move both the motions? Moved. Thank you very much. We turn now to decision time. The first question is that motion 12169 in the name of Joan McAlpine on Erasmus be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that motion 12259 in the name of Joe, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau on committee membership be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the final question is that motion 12260 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on committee substitution be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business in the name of Rhoda Grant on campaign for focused ultrasound device. And we'll just take a few moments for the members and ministers to change seats. <laughs> 